Hey, folks, it's Thursday, and that means tonight is the night for Sirens on the USA Network. It's the new original comedy series created by Dennis Leary of Rescue Me and Bob Fisher of Wedding Crashers. Thursday is always a great night for comedy, and so the USA Network has got you covered with a new show for you to get hooked on. Sirens, a new USA original series, Thursdays at 10, 9 central, only on USA Network. All right, let's do this, folks. Let's do the show now. Yeah. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers, what the fuck buddies, what the fucking ears, what the fuck sticks, what the fuckadelics, what the fuckle heads, what the fuckle bunnies? I am Mark Marin. This is WTF. Thank you for listening to my show. I'm happy you're here. I appreciate you being here. I'm thrilled today to present to you a conversation with the, uh, with the, uh, thoughtful and, and trippy Duncan Trussell. Duncan Trussell, who, uh, who I've known for a while. Uh, we've hung out a couple of times. I always enjoy him. He's a very, he's, he's a pleasant, uh, thoughtful man, curious, intelligent, hilarious. Duncan is a comedian. He used to do this trippy thing with a puppet that I, that I enjoyed. It was out there, man. But at the time, he was briefly worked at the comedy store and, uh, he was the guy responsible, you know, 20 years after the fact for getting my name painted on the wall. And I will talk to him about that. I will. I'm glad so many of you enjoyed the Lena Dunham episode. A lot of uh, a lot of conversation instigated around that, and I gotta say, uh, some of you who comment on the comment board are disappointing, disappointing humans. I don't always know if it's the greatest thing in the world that we have the freedom to share the absolute worst kind of unbridled, unfiltered, thoughtless, impulsive garbage anytime we want to, and anonymously. Don't know if it's always a great thing. Look, I'm all for freedom. I'm all for freedom of speech. But some of you guys are just, just fucking horrendous people. And you know I'm not talking to you if I'm not talking to you. It just amazes me that on my comment board that, you know, it's not even that, it's not even a heavy traffic situation ever. Except when there's women on it. And then these garbage heads come out of nowhere to dump garbage into the feed. Just pure misogynistic, intolerant garbage. I don't know who they are or whether they seek it out or whether they're actual listeners or what. But it, it only happens when women are on the show. And there was some good backlash to it on the, on the comment board. And, uh, you know, I, I was happy to see that. I don't get engaged with it. I do read it occasionally. I find it disappointing. I don't know who the fuck these people are sometimes. It's just ridiculous that, that it only happens when women are on the show. Hey, if you're going to take a dump on somebody just because you've got problems with yourself, why don't you spread it around a little bit? Do it to all the shows if you're going to be that person. You know what I mean? We have a new sponsor today. It's called Harry's. And let me tell you a little bit about why Harry's exists. This guy, Andy, went to the drugstore. He waited like 10 minutes for someone to unlock the case where the razors were being held. He bought a four-pack of blades and some shaving cream. Then he goes to checkout and drops 25 bucks on these blades he didn't really like. And he spent a long time buying them. So Andy and his buddy Jeff decided to make a better way for people to buy the stuff they need. Yeah, okay, sounds good. Harry's gives guys a great shaving experience at half the price of stuff from the drugstore. Fifteen bucks gets you a razor, three blades, and shave cream shipped to your door. Harry's even offers a custom engraving option to engrave your initials on the razor, and you get the convenience and ease of ordering all this online. I got a shaving kit from Harry's. All the stuff was there. It was shipped directly to my house. No trip to the drugstore necessary for some overpriced blades. Go to harrys.com and use the promo code WTF, and Harry's will throw in a free four-pack of blades with your first purchase for all WTF listeners. Just add a four-pack of blades into your shopping cart, and they won't cost you a thing. That's harrys.com, promo code WTF. Yeah, man, I hit a wall with humanity. I hit a wall with humanity the other day. Sometimes I'm on Twitter, I hit a wall with humanity. I'm on my comment board, I hit a wall. Just people spewing garbage because they can anonymously. Horrendous. I had problems with Time Warner, so I took it to the people. I took it to the streets. I tweeted my problems with Time Warner because if they want to have a Twitter presence then they're asking for that. 
That's exactly what they want. They think this is a way to save customers, to get more customers. Hey, we got to be on a social networking platform. All right, there you are. That is not a customer service representative. That is somebody representing a company on a social networking platform. I don't, I can't believe that in this, in the world we live in, that there's such this weird kind of like cynical apathy when it comes to corporate monopolies. Ted, that's the way it is. You know, man up. That's the way it is. You get fucked even though you're paying for it. That's just, that, that's how it is. That weird kind of like almost nihilistic surrender of your will to something you're fundamentally almost anti-American. It's bizarre. Corporate apologists, hey, quit whining, fuck you, fuck you. You know, you should always fucking call out garbage companies any way you can. I don't know why the fuck we've made so many compromises around speaking out around, you know, the bullshit that we can speak out about. So after all is said and done, I have no idea if that had anything to do with anything, but last night my internet was fast as fuck. And I'm, I'm wary, uh, to thank Time Warner. Maybe, you know, maybe it did have something to do. Maybe they did snap to it. I, see, that's the thing. Where's the guy that calls and says, we took care of that for you, Mr. Marin. We understood you were upset about that. We got a guy out there immediately. Even if whoever the motherfucker that was downloading porn and Netflix and 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 uploading an entire music library simultaneously for the last five nights, who probably clogged the fucking node, so no one in this area could use it. Even if that guy exists out there, why don't they take credit? That's good business. That just shows you that their customer service is really crap. If they don't have a guy that calls and goes, "Oh, I saw that your internet's working. Yeah, we took care of that for you. We worked all night on that, man. We had a guy up there on the pole." For three hours, because we wanted you to feel better. That's the job they should be concerned about. Where's that guy? Hey, uh, before I forget, another reminder, USA Network presents Sirens, a new original series, Thursdays at 10, 9 central. That's tonight, people. Only on USA Network. They're calling this a life or death situation comedy from executive producers Dennis Leary and Bob Fisher. Dennis is an executive producer on my show, Marin, which premieres May 8th. I'll slip that in. So I trust his judgment when it comes to TV comedies. Sirens is about three EMTs who are great at their jobs, but not so great at everything else. You've got Johnny, a sports-loving Chicago EMT, working with his best friends, Hank. And they've taken Brian under their wing, a wide-eyed and excitable new EMT who still lives with his parents. Funny things happen when you save lives for a living. Sirens, a new original series Thursdays at 10, 9 central, immediately following a new episode of the hit series Suits. Oh, for those of you who are concerned about my cats, uh, I've got an update. In just a nick of time, I got the suture out of my cat's face. I don't know how I did it. I was paralyzed with fear. I was approaching this cat as if I were about to ride a bull. I think I had the same level of fear within the context of my life when I would consider wrapping the cat in a blanket or a towel, holding the cat down, pulling the cat's head back. This is a vicious, wild cat at heart. There's no peace in this cat. No peace at all. She pretends to be peaceful when she wants some love or a little, a little touching when she needs to eat. But other than that, wild fucking animal. No peace of, at heart. No peace of mind. Even looks in her eyes. You know, there's a comfort there for a minute. And then there's just sort of like, I am going to fucking rip you to shreds if you fuck with me at all. That's who my cat is inside. So it's like riding a bull, folks. But I don't know. Like, every day I tried to approach her and she'd freak out. Got to the point where she knew I was coming. I'd she'd see the clipper in my hand. It was just, it was ridiculous. And the, it was straining our relationship. I didn't know if we would ever recover from her suspicion. And I don't know what happened yesterday. I'm, you know, I, I gotta, I gotta travel. And yesterday I just, I grabbed her by the scruff of the neck. I pulled her head back and just held it. And I clipped that thing off. And I didn't have to take her to the vet. I thought I was gonna have to take her to the vet. And by the way, I know a lot of you heard about the earthquake, but I lived through it. Not only, not only did I live through it, I almost slept through it. I woke up and this is, I've been through enough earthquakes now where I woke up and, uh, you know, moon was there, and we both stood there, and she went, earthquake. I'm like, yep, earthquake, just just hang out a minute. And I just felt it, got a sense of it, got a feeling for its duration, didn't get out of bed. That's how I handled the earthquake. 
generally, if you feel it really going deep, you know, I, I don't know about this doorway business or bathtubs or anything else. For me, if you're in a neighborhood that doesn't have a lot of tall buildings and not a lot of power wires around, get the fuck out of the house. Go far from structure. So structure do not fall on you. That's my feeling. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm, I'm probably wrong. I'm sure if I'm not reading a guidebook, but that's my impulse. That thing could fall down. I'm going to move away from it. I'm going to move away from any possibility of being hit with heavy shit. So, made it through that. All right, look, I know I'm a little edgy. I'm still a little sick. Uh, I enjoy talking to you people. And it's my pleasure right now to uh, to talk to Duncan Trussell. Uh, I hope you enjoy this. I had a very nice time with Duncan. Today, today I... Uh, what is the routine, Duncan? Well, the routine is I, I wake up, walk my dog. Yeah. Down by the L.A. River. What kind of dog? A little chihuahua. You have a chihuahua? A chihuahua Jack Russell mix. Did you inherit that? I adopted. You adopted the dog? Fox. From... Huh? His name's Fox. His name's Fox. Yeah. You adopted it on your own, not with the girl. No, on my own. Okay. Can you believe that? This is the first time I've never had a meat handcuff between me and another person. There's yeah. always a pet yeah. lassoing me to somebody yeah. forever. Yeah. Well, I mean, until the breakup. Is that true? You had dogs with women that, that you had to share custody of? Is that what you're no, saying? No, no shared custody. I had a dog, two dogs with Natasha. Right. And I, when I left, I just thought, well, That's who the over. fuck would want to go stay with me? These dogs should stay with, with Natasha. Her? And I just didn't want to, I, it seems like that thing, like skulking over to your, I mean, I can understand with kids, but yeah. skulking over to your ex-girlfriend's house to yeah. like pet your dog, that just seems so pathetic. No, I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I believe that's true. I mean, I, I love the dog, but if the dog is well cared for, you're going to have to let that dog go. you got to let it go. I mean, some people think that way about kids. I don't necessarily agree with that. You know, that kid will be fine without me, probably be better off without me. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know about that. I don't either. I don't know. So you got this little girl dog. Me now? A, a girlish dog. How dare you? Are you I'm calling my dog girlish? I don't know. It's a chihuahua. A chihuahua? Chihuahua. 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 A chihuahua. Gr- girlish dog. Holy shit, man. I never knew it. I didn't, what? I, I didn't know you were sexist. I thought you were completely open-minded. But I'm now very you, open-minded. How dare you assign gender traits to an animal? That is not cool. My dog, by the way, is more masculine than I am. Much I, I think I was actually <laughs> assigning those traits to you. Oh. That, that was... <laughs> You know, dog is a dog, but that was a dog I'm more accustomed to seeing perhaps as a, an accessory for a, for a woman who might be walking down the street. Listen like to a- you! Listen to you, man. That's what women do. They carry chihuahuas around in purses. I didn't say purses. You just said that. So <laughs> You got me! <laughs> uh. No, I mean, I, I think it's... I like... Look, I'm a cat person. What do I know? Well... I had dogs. Did you grow up with dogs? Yeah, I grew up with dogs. How many dogs? Let's see. We had Georgia, and then there was Jenny. Yeah. And that's... That was it? Those are the two. But where the hell do you come from? Like, the first time I met you, you were you were booking the comedy store. Yes. You were this strange. Your hair always seemed a little dirty to me. Yeah. Uh, you didn't have a beard or mustache. Yeah. You had kind of a, a weird vibe that was always a, l- a little slightly tweaked. But I liked you. Yeah. Uh, my experience with the comedy store goes way back, and you were sort of uh, like, I was like, well, how integrated is he into this situation? Is he uh, is he part of it? Is he an extension of it? Yeah. Uh, did it invent him? Mm. And then, uh, but you were the guy that got my name on the wall. Oh, you, I did? Yeah, you're the one who made that happen. For uh, my entire life, I did not have my name on the wall, and you somehow took care of that. Am I wrong in saying that? Uh, you're wrong in saying that. I mean, I wish I could take credit for it. I believe it, but... you did. Why do you, why do you say that? I mean, when I came back around, it wasn't on the wall and you were booking the place. Well, I was the guy who made the phone call, but at the time, Mitzi was running everything. So I, I really, it wasn't like I had some. Who put it in her head that my name wasn't on the wall? Well, see, that's the thing, man. You think you're the only comic who was like freaking out because their name wasn't on the wall? I like, wasn't freaking out though. But, well, a lot of comics 
thought, like, look at that as like a big achievement. Yeah. So you would get this sort of like a, a drizzle of phone calls right. throughout the week. Yeah. With <laughs> just every once in a while, some <laughs> yeah. lost comic going, yeah. "What's the deal?" Yeah. Yeah. For for real. What do I got to do? Yeah. Yeah. Once I called the comic and told them Mitzi wanted them to come and paint their name off the wall. <laughs> Who was that? I think it was Vicky Barbalock. Remember her? Who? I don't even know why I did it. Like out of nowhere? Yeah. Mitzi with the few marbles so, she has left? You get so bored up there, man. When I was working there, you're up in the top of the fucking comedy store. It's like having an office in the haunted mansion. So yeah. You just get bored up there, and, and you're talking to comedians all day, <laughs> yeah, so it's, yeah. you're just talking to like the nation's weirdest people on earth all day long. So you definitely can get a little tweaked out in that situation. But what well, I don't understand, she uh, so you were dealing with Mitzi before she went all before she left entirely in a way. Oh yeah, yeah, I was with her when she was she was. Comp- I mean, I I don't know how she is now, but when I was there, it was. Was she sick yet? She was sick. Yeah, right. She was sick. And before I was the talent coordinator, I was the runner. So I would. Dr- I did that job. No way. Sure. Were you, well, you had to get her a chicken salad? Oh, well, I had to, yes. You get her chicken, cow tongue sandwich. Cow tongue? Oh, really? Yeah. So you had to go where? To Cantor's? Where do they have, or where, Nate and Al's? Where do you get cow tongue? It was, it was, I think it was Cantor's. Uh-huh. They, I don't remember that. No, it was some grocery store around where she lived. But it was just, I remember the first time I went to pick that up, you know, uh-huh. and get me a cow tongue. And that's some, that's some old Jew shit there, buddy. It just seems like, it seems like, like old Satanist shit, you know, when you're going to pick up a cow tongue, like it feels like you're getting implements for some kind of yeah. diabolic But ritual. then when you see that it's like thinly sliced cow tongue that, that is on a sandwich, does it still reek of Satan to you? Not anymore. <laughs> Especially when I tasted it. <laughs> it wasn't bad, right? It wasn't bad at all. No. So you come out to L.A. from where? From North Carolina. So you grew up in the South? Yes. That was your life? Yeah. I mean, kind of. I mean, I didn't grow up in the South. I, I, I Raleigh? I, well, I bounced around a bunch. I just say North Carolina because that's where I went to high school and junior high school. Yeah. But my folks uh, got divorced, and before that, they were always traveling around. So I, uh, I was in Georgia. I've been in Texas. I was in Chattanooga. Tennessee, I was in, you know, uh, Maryland, Maryland. Uh huh. So a lot of bouncing around. Because you were with who? Well, this was when, when my parents were married. Mm-hmm. I think they had a pretty tumultuous, uh, marriage and were always moving around. Cause that happens when people are sort of unstable. You yeah. Know, you go from one place to the next looking for, I guess, a job that, uh-huh. you, that you could live on, feed kids with. How many kids were there? Me and my brother. So how old is he? Younger or older? He, he's older. Oh, really? Yeah. Is he around? He's around, yeah. Yeah? How'd he turn out? Great. Yeah? Yeah, he just had a baby. Oh, so yeah. you're an uncle. I'm an uncle. First time? Yep. That's exciting. Yeah, it's great. Where's he at? He's in Maryland. So it was really, but you had this sort of like Southern American experience in a way. Texas. Uh, yeah. Georgia. Mm-hmm. Uh, North Carolina. It's yeah. pretty. It's rural. Yes. It's deeply rooted in the uh, in the history of our country. Mm, yeah. Did you feel that? Well, no, I never felt that. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was nice. I mean, it's beautiful to be around trees and the forest, yeah. and it was, it was really cool. But and of course, there's the you know stereotypical rednecks, yeah, uh, for sure. But did you go to school with those guys? Yeah, <laughs> but that was during the undocumented acid boom of the '90s. So the undocumented one. I think it was undocumented. Yeah. Well, let's document it. Tell yeah. me, when did that start? Did well, you start it? I wish. No, I had I had nothing to do with it, unfortunately. But there was a, a it used to be there was a time when it was very easy to obtain LSD. Yeah. And uh, that was when I was in high school. Yeah. And you could sort of it was when the Grateful Dead was touring. You know, the Grateful towards Dead, the end of it. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you, they sort of in their wake they left just vials and sheets of acid. You know, in every town that they went. Were through. you following the dead? I went to one dead show. I never followed them. I only went to two. What year are we talking? Uh, this was when I was in high school, 94? I'm not so, sure. I don't, I'd have to go back. I don't know when that would be. Was that towards the end of Jerry? Yes. Wow. Yeah. That was towards the end. Yeah. So that, was that a mind-blowing experience? Nah, not the show. What right. was a mind-blowing experience was the parking lot. The parking lot was just... <laughs> Crazy. Holy shit. What the <laughs> fuck is this, man? Yeah, yeah. You would see like, you know... Kids on skateboards holding cases of beer, and they're like, beer for sale, beer yeah. for sale. And yeah. then they get by your car, and they're like, acid doses, doses, acid. doses, yeah. doses. Whoa, everyone's yeah. just selling acid and yeah. mushrooms and yeah. nitrous oxide. And you end up like, 
Well, we oh nitrous. I, I uh, haven't got a sort of weird kind of buzz from a word in a while, but nitrous. That's the ohm, man. <laughs> yeah. You're hearing the universal <laughs> ohm. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, there, I think the guy who there was someone who's famous for for I mean, he didn't invent it, but someone who started inhaling it back when there was that. Uh, burst of spiritualism in the United States. Yeah. He thought that you could inhale nitrous oxide and talk to dead people. He thought it was a way to like commune. You gotta, you gotta keep inhaling it and pacing yourself. <laughs> because, yes. you know, if you're gonna have a conversation with a dead person on nitrous, you got about a, maybe a 40 second window. <laughs> hey, really... hey, are you okay? <laughs> yeah. Shit! <laughs> <laughs> you better talk quick. Cause you're re-entering. Yeah, we had a tank in, uh, my, uh, my roommates had a tank when I was in college, like a full tank that they had gotten from some dental supply house. Yeah. And we used to fill garbage bags up with it. And it was just, it was kind of a tragic thing to watch, really. Not as tragic as heroin or another thing, but, you know, just people sitting on a couch. Yeah. With garbage bags filled with nitrous going, <sighs> until they, then they'd sort of drift off and all the nitrous would go out of the bag. Yeah. But uh, yeah. but it, it, your coloring is not great when you're doing that. No, your fucking lips turn blue. It's, <laughs> it, it's it's awful. That's where the term fishing came from. Did you know that fish? No. So there, the, so there was a term called fishing, which was that after you had inhaled pharmaceutical grade nitrous oxide yeah. and had then passed out onto the parking lot, right? You would begin to have a mild seizure. And right. that seizure was called like a fish flopping around. Right. And that was the name for someone who had OD'd on nitrous oxide. And that's where fish came from? I, I assume, but I don't know. So you're speculating. I'm speculating. Because you came no into idea. this with a little bit of confidence. Well, I, I, ha I don't have confidence about my fish knowledge. <laughs> All right, and you started it. I, I went to. I did go to a fish concert, but I didn't like it. No, I, I have no idea what they are, but I did put on American Beauty for you before we came out here, and we locked in. Yeah. I know I can speak Grateful Dead to a certain degree. I'm a big fan. That song is so great, man. Box of Rain. Box of Rain. Broke Down uh, Palace is, is my song. Oh, God. That kills me. I Every mean, I, time you break up, it's Elliot Smith and then mix in Broke Down Palace. That uh, is the that is the breakup yeah, mix. Yeah, if you want to cry. Ugh. Uh, so wait, now this is, you are sort of a, 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 no, a known, um, drug warrior. Mm hmm. And so this time in your life, how old were you when you, when you first did acid? I was in the 10th grade when I first did acid. Now was that something that changed everything? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, yeah, I What were you doing before that? Well, I mean, you're going to high school. Like, yeah. So what are you You're doing? Just trying to figure it out. You're trying to figure it out, but it's also, I mean, the, the thing about high school is it's a, it's, a, it's essentially, it's an a, internment camp for teenagers where you're being forced to sit down and like get all this information injected into your brain by people who maybe don't even want to be doing what they're doing. Some of them do, but there's just this sense of like, it's just this sense of claustrophobic dread that it induces in, yeah. in kids. Do you see an alternative? Would to you, that? Yeah. To going to high school? Yeah, what would you prefer? I think that, well, I would prefer teachers to make as much as doctors in right. some fantasy world. That's, right. That, if there was, so they'd be into it. Because there are teachers that somehow get through. Like, there was maybe one or two in high school that was like, all right, they're still, you know, into it for the most part, and they'll resonate. They can change your life. Yes. But, uh, so you just think that... Instead of an internment camp, if we could make it something that we were excited to do and people were excited to share, yeah, uh, yeah, that would be good. That would be. But you're not for no schooling at all. Just you know, at age ten, like good luck with everything. We don't need no education, bro. <laughs> 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 what am I gonna learn, man? That I don't already know. Yeah, man, just look at a sunflower. Yeah. Um. No, I, I, I think that education is, is the greatest thing i think a, a sad thing is people what what happens when you like get shoved into those places and you're getting bullied and and, and like, oh yeah the dynamic the hierarchy uh, the, uh, the weird uh caste system almost yeah, it's brutal and and then so then all of a sudden you get this awful it's the same like learning is one of the most psychedelic crazy things oh, yeah, yeah. it just if you find the right book or even just read the right chapter change everything everything changes yeah could be uh, a paragraph. A paragraph. Yeah, why are you like you are? There's a paragraph in a book and it's fucking changed everything. It's magic. Yeah, it's yeah. and 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 what ends up happening is that people begin to associate learning with being sitting in uncomfortable desks with somebody kicking the back of your uh, kicking you I I, I, yeah. I got nothing. 
nothing connected. I don't know how to do anything I learned in high school. Yeah. I mean, a few things may have connected, but I slept a lot during class. Yes. Uh, I read maybe one or two stories that were good. I have one teacher that was great because we wrote poetry, and I found that I, I did that, and it was a very profound experience to me. But for the most part, it was just trying to survive in the social structure of high school. Yes. And feeling very uncomfortable. Yeah. And throwing up places. Throwing up? Sure. That was a big thing in, in all public schools. People are always puking. That's well, I mean, just going out and drinking and getting oh, sick. And, no, no, I wasn't puking at school. You didn't want to be that kid. No, where yeah. they throw down the sawdust. Something, uh, something happened. And kids are looking to see what oh, was yeah. in it. And like then they, f- forever you're that kid. Who pu- well, we had a kid. There was a kid when I was in elementary school yeah. who had the awful problem that if he saw someone mix food together, he would throw up. <laughs> So that was like every lunch, somebody would mix food in front of him, and he, you'd always hear him like, "No, please, just don't do it." <laughs> Sad <laughs> plea. <laughs> Sad plea. <laughs> don't mix the peas with the potatoes. Here we go. <laughs> that poor guy. I wonder if he's still like that. No. Some people cannot mix food on a plate. It's just, it's like a, a, a cardinal sin to them. He got really badly addicted to painkillers, I think. And what else died. are you going to do with that problem? <laughs> you, you can't get through a meal with anybody. There's, take something to take the you edge off. You inject a lot just, just to eat a hamburger. With someone else across from you. Because they might stick some uh, french fries and ketchup and you're going to be fucking <laughs> over. So what was the, uh, the well, what's your, what, what kind of business was uh, your family in? Well, my mom yeah. was a psychologist. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And and my dad was a, uh, he ran a shopping center. Like a, like a strip mall? Yeah. Yeah? In Mobile, Alabama. In Mobile, Alabama. Yeah, this is after the divorce. Uh-huh. Before that, he was a lot of different things. He was one of those guys? Yeah. What's dad doing this week? Yeah. What were some of the, uh, what was the list? It was always involved, he always worked at like real estate offices. And, Commercial real estate? Yeah, in right. the South, you know, right. like, or business, yeah, business, yeah, business real estate. Right, and, right. So, yeah, that was part of going to visit him was, you know, he would try to, his idea was to, like, turn us into men. Yeah. So he would, like, give us just these shitty fucking jobs working for his company. Yeah. You know, like, in the South, like, chopping fucking shrubs in in, in the South all day. Yeah. Always fending off molestation. What do you mean fending off molestation? There was just this weird old guy who like worked down in the shop where I had to work. Yeah. And like I can remember it was just this bad vibe I got from him. And like he was always getting a little too close to me. And then like at one point he's like, I got a pacemaker. He's like, put your ear to my mouth. Listen, listen. And like opened his mouth and like, I didn't put my ear in his mouth, but like. Did you hear the ocean? Yeah, you heard the ocean screaming. <laughs> Get me out of this perverted old man! <laughs> what did you hear when you stuck your ear to his mouth? I heard my own adrenaline, just like, what's happening? Like, why is this happening to me? He said, he's like, my pacemaker sounds like a little bird. <laughs> <laughs> that is the weirdest. Yeah. I guess if you're a little kid, you're like, nah, <laughs> that you might do that. Yeah, but he, um. Is that the end of the memory? That's well, no. Actually, I I trapped some cats that summer. There was like some stray cats, mm-hmm. and kittens, and like I trapped them and then took them back home. But then they were feral, and I couldn't. What's that got to do with the old man? I don't know, Mark. All right, same period. Happened in the same, same period. period. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's your dad's doing. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's my dad's doing. I don't blame my dad. That's just the world. Yeah. You know? But he set you up with the gig. He just he was trying to get show me what hard work was like. I but guess. But it doesn't sound like he was doing it. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> well, no, I mean, he's working at a desk. Exactly. I wish I'd thought of that when I was, when he was like, when we were driving through a Hardy's drive through at 6 a.m. and I knew I had to go chop weeds for the day. <laughs> he's going to sit out somewhere. What a great Make point. A couple phone calls. <laughs> so your mom was a clinical psychologist? Yes. Really? Yeah. Hippie style or straight up? Um, I'm going to say hippie style. Uh huh. For uh-huh. sure. Yeah. Hippie style. Yeah. So you had the books around? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. How do you know about the books? Well, which ones? Which ones did you get into? Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Is that what you're sure. talking about? Well, sure. That, that falls under hippie psychology. Sure. Yeah. You know, that, those kinds of books. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, Jack Cornfield. Of course, Ram Dass. Like, yeah. 
really got in. I still love. She the had Ram the Ramdas books. Well, she had these cassette tapes. Uh-huh. Like you remember when they used to like they they used to have like these weird like I don't know plastic containers filled with like an audio yeah 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 series. sure so sure she had sure. those with so. no labels on them just like one Ramdas at so and so yes. One and then two. Exactly. And then, yeah, yeah. That was it. So we would ah. listen to those in the car as like as we drove, and and I didn't really care for it at the time. Like I wanted would, to listen to music. Well, yeah, and I just didn't want to do anything my mom was doing. So yeah. that so she I was just, the enemy. Y- yeah, Not yeah. The other guy. Not my dad. Huh. No, it was my mom. My mom and I had a really like uh-huh. on the, like turbulent sort of relationship. It isn't interesting? You seem to be more in the groove of what she inspired. Now, yeah, and then uh, the opposite. You're not doing commercial real estate. You're, you know, you're well, thinking you... about Satanism and listening to Manson music. <laughs> that's not like that's not what my mom did. But the antidote, a journey the, of the mind, is what I'm saying. That journey antidote. of the mind. Yeah. Well, I, I, I love. I'm not going to say I don't like listening to Manson records or hey, reading well, about very, Charles Manson. Uh, very, one of the great entertainers of the 20th century. Really was, man. Yeah. One of the great performance artists yeah. oh, and truly an, a staple of yeah. American Real history. risk taker. Yeah, real <laughs> risk taker. He went for it. He sure did go he for it. He fucking went for it, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you got the books. So that's where must something must have gotten through then, listening to that 60s shit, right? Well, I think that... How old are you? I'm 39. All right, so they were probably just a little older than me. Wow, yeah, I guess so. Because I'm 50. Yeah, yeah, right. I guess so. So they were actual boomers. They probably, you know, kind of what muddled through the 60s and all that explosion somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. That's right. So your mom picked up on that kind of like, you know, we can make it a good place if we change our minds no. business. My mom didn't pick up. My mom, what happened is my mom went through a divorce and... Uh, and then somewhere after that, she started finding out about this stuff. She wasn't a hippie. Uh-huh. She was. It's a, our, our family on her side is a very traditional Southern family. So the, really, yes, she wasn't a hippie as far as I am aware. When when she married my dad, I don't think she became a hippie then. It was when we came to North Carolina that she started coming into contact with that stuff. And she was ready to rebel. In a way, because what your parents like, they met and they were both kind of regular Southern conservative people, and then the divorce kind of fucked her head up. Yeah, yes, right. I think so. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. that's what happens. Is you, I mean, I think that happens to to so many people is they don't consider the, I, they don't even think about why they're getting married. In yeah. fact, then right. you didn't even think like, why right. would I get married or right. do this? You just do it. Let alone have kids. Well, look what we did. Yeah. Now what? Yeah. Yeah. And then suddenly the thing starts curdling and falling apart. And it's not like now where everyone gets, where getting married is just a sort of, I yeah. don't know what it is. I'm not sure either. Back then it was a, it was a, a very serious thing. And so then when the, the divorce falls apart and you end up with two fucking kids and you've, that's a wonderful contact with truth. And I think whenever you come in contact with truth, sometimes it'll push you in the direction of trying to, you know, understand uh, how to get closer to that facet of the universe. And a lot of those books help you do that in a way that I, th- I don't think they teach you anywhere else. So when you say truth is a facet of the universe, which one were you referring to? Children? Im- impermanence. Mm-hmm. Oh, you mean that it, it ends? Yeah, that it not it not just that it ends, but yeah, everything ends. Yeah, like everything. Some ends. faster than others. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly. A, it's a matter of pacing and timing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you. I mean, it's it's a, even like you know, even the way you feel like right now, that's yeah. going to change. Like everything's in this constant state of flux, and right. it's in the in the whole. It seems like the one of the aspects of living in the west is that you're taught that things don't really change or that you should expect things to stay the same well, that you're looking for 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 some security yes. and some uh some context that uh, that will make you feel like well th- this is my life now yeah i'm in it everything's changing yeah always always and you just got to live with that why fight it yeah you know that we're you know you're not going to stop it you know we're fighting entropy here that's There's exactly no- right yeah, yes. we're not just fighting. I mean, it's funny because we are entropy. It's I like know. we're entropy fighting itself. And I'm, that- I'm breaking apart right now. <laughs> I'm watching you vaporize in front of me. <laughs> it's amazing to see. I only do it for certain people. <laughs> it's so cool. I thought you could do that. <laughs> you can aerosolize yourself. That's amazing. Yeah, it took a lot of practice. Wow. It happened by accident. I had uh. gas, and then I found like, well, what? <laughs> but, but, like, let's track the mind-blowing because, I mean, at some point, 
you started thinking about things in a different way. I, I, I think when I met you, you were still doing the puppet thing. Yeah. And that was the big bit. And it was a pretty creepy bit. Yeah. And you were sort of hung up, I, I imagine, because you were into the comedy, so I could tell by the look in your eyes that you were, it had hold on you. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you, you sort of felt the tangible darkness of the place. Yes. And, and felt that you were part of that. Yes. And then at some point you extricated yourself and became a more, you, you fought the forces of darkness, contextualized them, and freed yourself somehow. But in order to have the tools for that, uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> It's great. I love it. I wish I, I'm going to have to go back and listen to that and get it. It'll be available. on my stomach. <laughs> Extricate yourself from the darkness. <laughs> get a handle on it. Yeah. But I mean, but when did uh, you first start dealing with, um, you know, a more cosmic approach to things? I mean, at what point? I mean, Ram Dass didn't affect you in the car, and then you took acid in 10th grade. But where did you start? Where did you, your brain start to kind of blow open? Yeah. You know, man, the funny thing about that is anytime you think you're, you've, oh yeah, my brain's really gotten blown open. It, it's, I don't know. I, I don't want to seem like I'm dodging that question. I don't know the answer to that. And I think that some, sometimes the way, uh, spiritual growth works is it's a very, very, very slow process. And, um, sometimes people f do this classic thing where they, start pretending to be spiritual or something you know like they like well yeah or they grab at fragments uh there there's a lot of that I, I know somebody i'm not saying it's a negative thing but to actually grasp something intellectually that you can make sense of does not mean that you can connect it to your heart or whatever you call the 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 soul or its or its connection to the the universe at large right you can sort of like oh i get it but you don't really get it right. until it gets you. Yes, yes, yes. That's it exactly, man. That's exactly right. Yeah. So you see the whole thing is kind of like a, um, uh, you end up, ever, I, my, in the beginning when I was really getting into this stuff yeah. and like reading Be Here Now or reading the Bhagavad Gita. Or Where, like, when was this? How many years ago? Well, this, uh, this would have been in high school when okay. I first came in contact so with it. So who gave you bit. that? Who gave you the Bhagavad Gita? The, before the Bhagavad Gita, it was the, was it a guy at a mall who was a shaved head? Uh, no, but I I'll t I I did hang out with the Hare Krishnas for a while and yeah, I, it's good I, food. What? Well, it's yeah. great fucking food, man. <laughs> and it's trippy, man. Yeah. That is some trippy All right, so shit. Wait, let's, we'll get there. So yeah, so I um uh so the first contact I guess would have been there was a book my mom had called Raja Yoga uh -huh. by Yogi Ramacharaka and uh -huh. I still remember it's a blue book. Really fancy looking, and it yeah. had on the on the spine a circle with a triangle in it. And it Ooh, just symbols! Seemed, whoo, yeah, very symbolic, yeah. man. What does that mean? What could it mean? Yeah. So then I started reading it, and that's the first time that I ever uh, really, like, I guess I may have come in contact with the idea, but the first time I really came into contact with the idea that you're not your thoughts, or right. that oh, right, 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 your attachment to your thoughts, yeah, yeah, and yeah. That, the idea that that what you think defines your personality, or that you are this ego, uh, is a delusion. Yeah. And so that was in this book, and the book had all these different exercises you could do that were designed to sort of take you out of the concept of you. So this was like a magic book, in um, a way. What do you, well, I mean, did you, in the sense that like. Here are these exercises, yeah. which for most practical purposes are rituals to yeah. facilitate this idea that you had just gleaned. Did yeah. you do the exercise? I did one of the exercises. What was it? So the exercise is you begin to refer to yourself in the third person, whatever you're doing. Like yeah. when you're walking around, you're just like, he is going to his car. He is sitting down. He is driving. He is listening to the radio. He feels sad. He feels happy. Uh -huh. And so this is just like, there's a lot of different versions of, of that exercise but the, the, it's designed to sort of cause you to zoom out a little right, bit right. from yourself and, right uh another great practice which i just read about which is really fun uh, and they say this is like the first thing that and i can't remember which sect of buddhism it is but when you become a monk yeah the first question they ask you is where are where are you in your body yeah tell me where you are in your body are right. you are you your hand or you in your heart are you your feelings find yourself in your body and right. then the more you sort of meditate on that, you realize, fuck, man, I'm not in my, I yeah, don't, I'm yeah. not here. No, no, I'm just a puppet for something bigger. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and I hadn't, I hadn't, uh, um, 
ever read anything like that before and so i think that was probably the beginning of it for me when you when that that yoga what's it called the raja it was yoga? called the the uh, raja, raja yoga. yoga by yogi ramachraka who was a by the way turned out to be some english guy named like Stephen williams or something yeah. i looked it up later he was just called himself yogi ramachraka why not he would sell books sure man the you know the you know hucksterism is a very important part of uh, modern spirituality yes yeah <laughs> you got a huge part you gotta have a good act you gotta have a good act man you gotta be <laughs> fancy you have to have some special <laughs> fucking angle it's hilarious well yeah. you are you know you're ta- you are somehow you know facilitating the shredding of uh of uh fragile egos yeah and then you must be able to implement yourself as their their channel their portal uh, into some larger understanding which may or may not be true oh right but the but the point of the matter is is anybody you talk to has been involved with those type of things they're like yeah i was in that for about eight years until i realized like you know i just yeah, I, I just needed a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's you know that's what I love about Ramdas is because he addresses that stuff in such an articulate, brilliant way. And what he says is these things, these different things that we get pulled into, Buddhism, Christianity, whatever it is, existentialism, eighth, becoming like a hardcore activist, skeptic, yeah. whatever the thing is. Uh, they're self-destructing traps. The best ones are self-destructing traps, and it's designed to get you in there and not keep you forever. It's designed to get you in there until you, like, wake up or just get what you need to get out of it. Right. You know, and not stay in it for your entire life. It's not a tr- It shouldn't be a trap. Right. It's like when you drive to the beach, you don't then just sit in your car. You go hang out on the beach. Right. If most people thought about that, and I think that's probably the, the recidivism rate. Is that what it's called for, for those kind of situations? It's probably fairly large. I mean, imagine a lot of people split. You yes. know, if the, if the leader doesn't crack up entirely. Yeah. But, but the people that stay are usually the people that, you know, do the office work. Right. You need somebody to run the business, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, it's a really, it's a, I think that it's, that's what's so funny about, uh, deciding to like meditate or get into this stuff and go in, into whichever way that you want to go into it is that it just, it's not, it's not about becoming something else. And it's not about deciding that this person or that person is the conduit for all truth in the universe. That's yeah. a ridiculous thing. It's that, and that's a weak thing, you yeah. know, I think, and it, it's really fucked up how people will allow themselves to seem like that thing. Like they'll pretend that they're that's the water. Racket. It's a racket. Yeah, but I and I also think the the under uh, the unspoken part of it is more so than not is that you know if somebody's lost and they're they're in a tremendous amount of fear they they need something to to grasp onto. But I, I think a lot of people and I talk about this this idea a lot here is that you know people need to feel part of something and 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 a lot of people can't don't have the fortitude to necessarily get to where you are, which is to to you know forego the middleman after a lot of research and just realize that you're part of something all times anyways and everything is in flux and that's it. Yeah. Some people need like a little more definition than that. Yeah. All right, so you're the guy that knows the thing? Okay. I uh, I'll be here with you for a while with these other people. What do you got? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and and it seems like the best uh the best teachers are the ones who don't allow that to happen you right, know you have right. to you really would have to you would wouldn't want that to happen i i don't think you would want that to happen you would want ideally i would think people to just recognize that you're just as much a part of the thing as they are i mean you're all part of the right but unfortunately you know uh, you know business is business for most of these people right well yeah i mean that is yes i think so i think some people are definitely they've just made that weird decision that i'm gonna fucking juice people and let them think i'm god yeah can you imagine it's a lot of responsibility oh you have to love people you also have to have no fucking conscience whatsoever on some level i mean you can love people but to 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 to, to, the, the what it takes the sort of blind side and gift that it takes to to actually whether you believe it or not to remain in that position, to know that people are following you. Yeah. Either you've got to really believe it for yourself, or you know somewhere in your heart that I'm taking these fucking people for a ride. Yeah, yeah. So sure. sadly, if you are a person that believes that you are that person, that God, that entity, yeah. then you got problems. Yeah. But if you're a person that's just taking people for a ride, it's a different set of problems. Yeah. And something, you know, a little more uh, dubious, but at least understandable. Yeah. Because then you're not necessarily a psychopath, you're just a fucking con man. 
But if you really believe it, then you got bigger problems. Here's the biggest fucking problem is that in the midst of all these monstrous charlatans, there are people who really wake up. There are people who wake up. They serve their purpose. Yeah. It's like the shitty teachers at high school. You never know. They get through sometimes. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, there are real... I, I do believe they're gurus. I do believe that there's teachers and people who have just done... Whether by like mutating their brain or maybe it's like a terrible accident or who knows, but they've somehow figured out a way to just become love or just generate yeah. love for, for people around them. Yeah. 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 And I think that's possible and it does happen rarely, but I think it does happen. So, so, okay. So, w- well, two questions. Where do you fall on the it's wired into us versus there's some sort of external, uh, continuity? Okay, I, well, I, you know, have you ever read the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali? No. It's fucking amazing, man. You should check it out. It sounds so, it sounds esoteric and hard to read, but it's really badass to read about, uh, the, uh, psychology. Like, the, the, he has this whole system of psychology in there, which is this idea that, so you, you sort of, you have the external world, right? And yeah. the external world, is reflected inside of your mind. Yeah. And that's definitely true. Like, sure. you can't argue with the fact that photons go into your, uh, that's our, nerves. our perception of the external world is limited to our perception. Yeah. Well, I, our perception of the external world is a reflect, a neurological, biochemical sure. reflection okay. of the external okay. world. Okay. So, um, so the idea is that, you know, you have a person in your mind, someone you don't like. I don't know. Yeah. And, and so that happens a lot when when someone's done done you wrong or yeah. you're, you have you're holding a grudge. Right. You'll think about this person and then you'll feel pissed off. You know, you'll right. get angry. Right? right. So the name that, that for that aspect of your brain show that, business is that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> show business is in your brain, man. But that that's called a vritti, which means kind of like a cyclone or tornado. So like. Spinning in your mind are all these little cyclones and tornadoes, which represent people that you like or people you don't like, uh-huh. and they're all replicas yeah. of the thing that you encountered in the external world. But right. it creates the illusion that the that the person that you're somehow connected to the person. Right. You know, when right. you're mad at someone, you're connected to them, but you're really not. You're just experiencing this little, tiny little part of your brain that is a. a, a biochemical reflection of that person right so when people and i i do wonder like is it outside of us or inside of us and then i just start thinking well i don't think it matters because we're outside we are outside like you're part of the universe like you're as much a part of the fabric very large part a wonderful part thank you very much yeah (laughs) but you're but but you're as much a part of the universe as a rock or a mountain or the sky so when people are like is it outside of us it's like well it's you're it. All one. What's outside of you anyway? Right. right. You know, all one. Exactly. Right. So, all right. So getting back to your first experience, you brought up the ego and the idea of moving the ego aside or or at least breaking it down. You're talking about Ram Dass, that the, his guru was able to, to free him from the ego long enough for him to have some sort of enlightenment or to find yeah. some sense of, of universal love or that type of possibility or continuity. I mean, when did you know that that was... Uh, on on the menu. I mean, was it from that you, that first book? I mean, when you say uh, he is going to sleep, he is driving a car. Yeah. He, that is an exercise to to what to distance yourself from the vessel. But I mean, ultimately, what is the what, to explain to me the idea of of ego eradication? Well, that's see, it's not eradication. Okay. It's, and that that can create a lot of problems for people because they start thinking like. Okay, here we go. I'm going to get spiritual, so let me just destroy myself because it's just so awful. I'm going to have to get rid of it. That's trouble. That's fucking trouble because now it's like now you're at war with yourself. And also it it leaves you vulnerable to being a fucking, uh, you know, uh, psychic dumpster. Yeah, (laughs) exactly, man. And it (laughs) it creates all this guilt. It creates all this guilt, and it's like, you know, most of us from, you know, when we were kids, the thing we always experienced was this our parents putting pressure on us in some way or another to be something different than the way we are. So that's been the status quo for most people for for their whole lives. It's after the parents, the school, yeah. will tell them to be someone else. And then after that, you know, the job maybe will like, they're always under pressure to not be who they are. So it's not ego eradication. It's more of a surrender that to, to just accepting like the way you are right now, this way that you are right now. Yeah. 
this is perfect. This is perfect. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't. That means you can just keep eating Doritos or don't exercise. Or no, it fine. just means that like if you if you don't accept it, the possibility of you uh, not only being miserable but continuing to do what's negative is high. Yeah, man. Exactly. That's exactly it. And, and, and the one thing most people have not tried is the practice of loving themselves. Most people have, they think that that's selfish or indulgent, or when they hear it, they're like, what are you, how? Well, yeah. Well, I, I think what it is, is it's sort of daunting. Because I think that what the West does is, is really keep us in a state of unneedable desire. It, it, that you know, capitalism in and of itself exploits desires. It requires you don't feel comfortable in order to persist. If you don't need things, then the whole system falls. Right. So you, you know, you got to be in a state of perpetual need, and you got to feel like you're not quite whole unless you have that thing. I need that thing. Yes. And how much does that thing cost? Well, there's a cheaper version of it. I, that's a pretty good thing. Maybe I can afford the, yes. the, the expensive thing. But any of that, you know, if if what you're saying is you know uh, you know full self consciousness and and the ability to self love is a threat to the order of things uh, on, a, on a larger level. But on an individual level, I think, unfortunately, we're wired to believe that that success, ambition, and, uh, and, and hard work, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, that you, we're really wired to believe that we're never enough, you know, whether it's by yeah. your parents or culturally, that, uh, you know, like, I'm not quite there yet, or, you know, it's never enough, you know, it's, it's not the process, it's the result very result driven career driven yeah. so loving yourself i mean the big question is like why why would i do that <laughs> uh, yeah how will i be able to survive yeah i mean i got things to do this is hell yeah how am i going to suffer in hell if i love myself you're going to ruin hell for me and also surrender is difficult because it does require that and you brought that up it does require that you know allowing yourself to to um to accept love you know that's tricky for me oh god have you I, figured it out? I it's so hard. It just makes you cry. You know, the the, the weird thing <laughs> it's just like so I don't true. I don't know why it's so uncomfortable. I can't quite figure it out. You haven't tracked it in yourself why you know cuz a lot of people are just like I think about entertainers. I was talking about this to another guy the other day is that like so many entertainers just bask in the love of the audience. I'm like not my experience. I, is, I, I will defy them to like me and when they do I'll question that. Yes. So but where does that come from? Yeah, well, well, because what it is is it's 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 fun to be like you, if you if you become somebody who lives in their mind, then the idea of being in your heart is is a it's a really tough transition. But but don't you think that the 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 act of living in your mind is is somehow a, an it's avoiding your heart. Oh, a hundred percent. It's a defensive action because you know you're so sensitive, or something, or some somebody took advantage of that, or, or some some somewhere along the line your heart got broken, and probably at a at an age where you couldn't even understand it. I mean, I believe that 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 you know heartbreak can happen you know very early on. Well, a heartbreak is a funny thing. Like people run away from heartbreak. Can't avoid it. You can't fucking avoid it. And also, it's like when your heart breaks, you that that is. I think the thing that a lot of people call heartbreak is actually contact with truth. And, 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 and so it, it's that feeling of, of, of actually touching ground on, on, on the terrain of the, the world that you're at. That you're is, it, in. is it truth or is it humility? I mean, it's, it's truth. To, like, I think heartbreak a lot of times is, is similar to, to that moment where you realize things did not work out the way you wanted to. You don't have control over most shit. And, uh, and, and, uh, and somehow or another, you've been, uh, rejected by something. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's a truth. But a lot of times heartbreak happens, uh, because you're untruthful. But I guess the tr I think, I think the truth is humility. But right? even if it's untruthful and heartbreak comes, then that feeling of loss is a, it, that's, loss. that's contact. That's truth. That's contact. Well, yeah, it's, it's, the truth is, You've you, just been handed your you ass. Were, yes. You were attached to something. It didn't work out the way you thought it would work out. Yeah. And now you're you're experiencing that 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 incredible feeling that people call heartbreak. And uh and it doesn't feel good. And of course you try to get away from it. You try to get away from it at all costs. And uh and it's a very strange thing because when you begin that's like when you begin to meditate or when you begin to to, to well, one big part of, of of sitting is you you don't you stop running away from heartbreak so you sit and you follow your breath and then you look at the way your body feels 
which is interesting in its own right, because you'll notice, like, shit, man, my my calf hurts. You'll yeah. have, like, these pains that you didn't even notice. Like, yeah. oh, weird, man, that fucking hurts. Oh, yeah. And then the more you do it, suddenly you, like, go into yourself and you realize, like, oh, man, I am so fucking lonely. Holy shit, I am lonely. And then... Instead of doing the thing that when you feel like that, a lot of people, when they feel like that, they're like, I'm going jogging yeah. or like, you know, I'm going to play video games or I'm going to uh, get stoned or I'm, whatever it is, you know, um, not that getting stoned is going to help you with your loneliness. It will amplify it. But the, the point is you, you go into that. The idea is you just keep trying to go back and back and back. So and- you accept it. Well, yeah, until, until you, yeah, until you accept it and, and, and yeah, I yep. guess that's the right word for it. Accept okay with it. it. Yeah, until you're okay with it and, and just and surrender to the fact that guess what? At this time in your life, right now, you're lonely. Stop pretending you're not. Stop acting like everything's okay. Stop walking around like you're fine. Be a lonely person for a while. Yeah. Let that be what it is. Stop trying to be different than the way you are. Nothing's wrong with you because you're lonely. Yeah. Why wouldn't you fucking be lonely? Look at where you're at. Yeah. You're you surrounded loser. by people. Per- yeah, you pathetic shit. <laughs> no one loves you. And look in the mirror and say that over and over and over again. Yeah, see, that's a, <laughs> that's a, that we took it as a dark turn. Everything was, guys. I'm releasing a, a series of guided meditation tapes. But so, but you're in, in your own personal journey. I mean, like uh, clearly. So you 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 read those books in high school, and then you drop some acid. But I mean, what what has been your desperate spiritual search? My desperate spiritual yeah. search. Yeah. What? Where, how'd you land here? Because I know when I first met you, this was not where you were. Well, you know, this year I got one of my balls chopped off, and my mom died. That's not gonna like. Um, that's a wonderful space. That's a wake up call. That's a wake up call. That's, those are two truths. Those you're, are two big. You're a, you're a ball shy and no mommy. Yeah, yeah. Is that the name of your new CD? <laughs> it a, is. A ball shy and no mommy. <laughs> that just sounds like the saddest kids song. Just like some orphan singing that in front of a I'm factory. A ball shy and I got no them. mommy. <laughs> I got tons of kids singing. That's where everything turned around. In a way, where were you before that? Where were you before the cancer? What were you doing? Well, you know, I had fucking hubris, man. Like before, before cancer and and my mom dying, I think that I was like, um, I took people for granted in a, in a in a way. Just didn't even know I was doing it. You know, just sort of like took people for granted. Took took what I I don't know. I think I was. I have to assume that at that time. I know you were sort of, you know, locked in with, uh, you know, with a certain way of thinking and with, with, you know, other comics and there was the darkness of the store. And, you know, I have to assume that, you know, in, in terms of your spiritual path now, you have to look at that as some diversion. It's a big diversion, man. And the comedy, I, the comedy was doing, I was touring. Um, I was touring and because of the podcast, I was getting people at the shows yeah. and, it was great. It was really great. And then, um. But you were compelled by, uh, uh, morbid fascination and darkness. Yeah, I went through a period like that. For sure. I know exactly what you're saying, man. I know exactly what you're saying. And you're damn right. Yeah, like I did the puppet, like, I performed the puppet act at the wedding of the grandson of the founder of the Church of Satan in front of a bunch of Satanists. And you were into stuff. it. Well, I was fascinated by it. I right. really was. And I think that's actually a lot of... I know a lot of people who get into that or get into some version of but that. It was Anton LaVey's grandson? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But people get into that stuff, and I know why they get into that. Uh, yeah, because it's sexy. Well, yeah, it's sexy, but it's also because they think that it... it they think that, like, power works. You know, like, they think that, like... Right. Like, the will thing. Yeah. The, yeah. Which is... which. You know, like with Crowley, people confuse like Alistair Crowley with Satanism a bunch, but yeah. it's not at all. It's not Satanism at all. But his idea is do do as thou will uh, shall be the whole of the law. Uh, and then the next line that no one ever says is love is the law, love under will. So the idea is like your your um, love is the most important. Thing. I think that most people that enter the world of Crowley after about four pages go like, I don't fucking get this. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. It, there's a lot of force fields surrounding that stuff for people. And then, I mean, fuck, do you want to get it? It's like your great joke about Scientology where you're afraid to read. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah your, how yeah. does it go? I love that I joke. I can't remember. It's like, you know, I, you know, I, don't, I don't even pick up the book because I don't know where it happens. At what page you're like, I'm in. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> 
really yeah, yeah. want to end up standing in your fucking living room right, right. at 6 a.m. wearing robes right, and yeah. doing the Where to now, of- Mr. Cruz? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. So, um, yeah, so I think a lot of people, it's it's an easy thing. And it's not just with, like, Satanism or the occult. So many people get pulled into other power games, you know, like they get into becoming a pickup artist or they get into, like, uh they get into like that book, The Laws of Power, and they yeah. think that everything's about manipulation and everything's that, like winning at all costs, no matter what. And they pretend to be but these. Though, it's so funny because like those are the same people that that go the other path. I mean, there's a desperation there. There's a desperation for for personal uh, advancement, for for feeling like you can achieve things. Yeah. You know, the same people that are looking for some sort of transcendence or some sort of spiritual guidance Absolutely. are the same people that are like, there's a moment at the end of The Wolf of Wall Street. Did you see The Wolf of Wall Street? I didn't Wolf? see it. I think it's a great movie. Um, but there's a moment at the very end where he looks out at an audience and that is it. That is just sort of like, help us. Help, we need, we're, we're, we're lost. Our lives aren't working out. Help us. Yeah. Yeah. That vulnerability that we all have. That's it. Yeah. That's it, man. And, and that's the whole, that's what I, the whole idea is like, you can do whatever it is you want to do, whatever you're drawn to doing. Yeah. Do it. Don't suddenly decide. I mean, not everything, guys. Yeah. Don't fucking set churches on fire or anything right. like that. But in general, if you just like recognize that there is, that there's so many different ways yeah. to, to start waking up. And yeah. that can even include like Satanism, which really Satanism, I would say, is just a Western version of worshiping Shiva, uh, which is the force of destruction or the, uh, the force of power in the universe. Unleash all your desires. Well, I mean, feel you, your, feel, feel your hatred. Yes. Yes. That's it. That's the idea. And it's like, and that, I think that's, there's something to be said for that. I know, but it's like, it's, it's, you're not going to win a lot of friends necessarily, maybe within the group. But, uh, you know, it, it, you're going to get sick, too. I mean, it, I think that, like, if you if you're an angry person and you let yourself hold on to anger too much, then your your body's probably going to. get Well, sick. I mean, were you did you did you practice in any way but the uh, the ideology of it? I mean, because I know that LeVay was sort of a huckster himself. But I mean, in some of the principles he was playing with in the in the satanic Bible, you know, were old magic principles. They, they weren't anything that he invented necessarily. No, I wouldn't say that I, no, I didn't practice. I just thought, you know, you, you hear some of the stuff you hear. And if you're like, if you, if you're an angry person or if you're somebody who like, uh, is, I don't know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a really easy, like you read it and you're like, well, that kind of, that kind of makes sense, you know? Like, that feels good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fuck that guy. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> you know, like I, I, can, I see it as a kind of art experiment too. Like if you look at the, 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 I can't remember. There's a there's a new satanic church. These are the guys who uh, I don't know if you heard about this, but they wanted to put a statue of Baphomet mm-hmm. in front of the a, a Capitol building somewhere because they had a statue of I think the Ten Commandments. Yeah. And so they were saying, look, if it's freedom of religion, we get to yeah. put yeah. this. Have you seen that picture? No. No. Oh, it's awesome. They they were like raising money. I think it's they're having they're going to go to court over it. But it's a statue, you know, Baphomet, the... Yeah, he's the Egyptian, right? Uh, well, they say he's Egyptian, the goat of Mendez, yeah, I think. Yeah, it's sure. like, so it's the that... horned guy. Pointing up, pointing down, hermaphrodite. Oh, yeah. Uh, so it's this hilarious statue of that being sitting in a throne mm. with two children at either side of yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. And it's... With the Lincoln Memorial in the background? It's, yeah, exactly. It's so <laughs> diabolic, man. But, um... Uh, yeah. But not, nothing's as diabolic as the Pentagon. So, I mean, they're in some exactly. stiff competition. Well, that's a funny thing, too, is like people yeah. who get overwrought about that stuff, they seem to be completely ignoring the fact yeah, that... Draw some lines across the points, and there's the biggest pentagram ever constructed. Or just look at history, and you can yeah. see since the 50s, I think the United States has killed at least half a million people. Yeah. So don't forget that. I mean, yeah. it's like, don't yeah. forget that you're probably living on the great dragon of the world if you're an american sure half a million people man that's mm. a lot of fucking people i was looking that up yesterday and just but it's sort of it's kind of mind-boggling when you consider that number well yeah i mean i used to do bits about that and you sort of look at the grid of washington and all the sort of uh, you know, masonic symbolism and G- egyptian symbolism and symbolism in general yeah you know, you, 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 I, I, I try to stay out of that rabbit hole yeah i d- i think that the uh it's a fun rabbit hole to to go into, but definitely it's just a diversion. I mean, all those conspiracies. It's like people who like are it's a work- fun rabbit hole to go into, but not to live in. And the, the the risk of, and you know this, the the fragility of the human mind to to somehow take a turn and and believe it's seeing something that 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 may or may not be real, but because it offers some sense of order, of history, of of good and evil. 
they'll lock in. Yeah. And then, you know, you're one of those guys. Right. You know, you're like, oh, here he goes again. Well, yeah, I mean, that's part of the conditioning is you're not supposed to say that the United States has killed half a million people since the 50s. Like, you don't, you know, that seems like something before they say the Pledge of Allegiance, the teachers should yeah, say. Yeah, you say that to me, and I'm like, that number seems a little low. I think it's low. It's, it's a conservative <laughs> estimate. <laughs> It's a conservative estimate. But it is, you know, and then you start saying that stuff, and it's strange because people will roll their eyes at you like, really? Yeah. Just don't talk about that. Can't you just live for today? Just live for today. It's like finding out you're at a party that runs on blood. Yeah. And it's a great fucking party, and you're telling people, you know this thing runs on blood, and they're like, shut the fuck up, man. This is the best party on the fucking block. Yeah. Look at the other parties. Yeah. You can't be gay in some of the other parties here. You can be gay. Yeah, yeah. Let it run on blood. Yeah, yeah. A wedding party here and there, we must sacrifice. We have to sacrifice. (laughs) The dragon must be fed. (laughs) Just drink the margaritas, man. I think we're feeding the dragon now. I don't know, man. I, I, you know... I, I think that you, you can get caught up in that stuff. Well, that's a fucked up thing, too, is that, you know, how much of, you know, what, you know, when you look at, like, uh, like the uh, 9-11 Truth people or, or, or Lyndon LaRouche people, you're like, we've become sort of untethered from any, any sort of, like, human unity that we know of. And we're able to cherry pick our ideology, our information, what we consider truth, what isn't truth. So I'm, I'm completely convinced that... All the truths are out there, but it's just sort of like maybe you'll come upon them or maybe you'll say they're bullshit, but it's all available. There's nothing being hidden anymore. Right. Well, I guess just assume everything's happening. Just accept that fact and then deal with your deal with what's inside of you, because if you really nothing want, is true, everything is permitted. Just deal with your own chemtrails in your heart. Stop worrying about the fucking chemtrails in the sky when inside of you, you're polluted with anger and greed and sadness. Right, so, you're saying, so that message is. Being available and opening your heart to universal love is ultimately the only solution. I mean, I can't. I mean, what else are you going to do? I mean, and that doesn't mean you can't continue to like be a be be feed the dragon, be an activist. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Whatever you could still you want to you can shovel fucking dead babies into the dragon's mouth, but it it would be better if you're going to shovel dead babies into a dragon's mouth. It would be, be crying. It would be. <laughs> No, that's creepy. There's something so creepy. Laugh while you do it. No, you want to. <laughs> no, you want to. You want to. I think that it's better to start practicing mindfulness. So if your job is scooping dead babies into the mouth of the dragon, then the first step in maybe getting away from that job, maybe. Is how does he feel when he's doing this? It's just watch yourself do it. Yeah. Are you really enjoying watching those lifeless I got no corpses choice. I got land? No choice. <laughs> Yeah, just watch that. Just watch that. And then the more you watch it, it does seem like that's when some small, small, small change happens. All right, so you go through this you know, relatively dark period in the name of your creativity, and then tell me about the uh, the ball cancer diagnosis. I mean, wh- wh- what happened? Walk me through that. Well, uh, so one of my balls got really big. Like I, big? Well, it was, you know... Yeah, it was big, man. Yeah. It got it was weird and big, and I yeah. knew something was wrong. But you think to yourself, well, I think the other day I accidentally hit myself in the balls, maybe. Yeah, like, yeah. you try to remember something. Yeah, like, yeah. maybe you were, like, did squats wrong or right, something. Right. I think I was exercising at the time, so uh-huh. it's like, probably an athletic injury. Probably. Yeah, and then you yeah. go on the internet. And you look up, look up your symptom, and it's yeah. just like, yeah, you've got cancer. Like, it's just like, you definitely probably have, you probably have cancer. And so... I feel like checking my balls right now. You would notice, man. Okay, okay. Oh, and also you're out of the age range statistically where people, I think people can still get it, but I was at the very end of like the age range when you get it. For those of you listening, getting paranoid about your balls, I, it wasn't like, I wonder if, if something's wrong. It's like something is fucking wrong. Like yeah. this is wrong. Right. So don't get paranoid and scared. Right. There's a lot of, a lot of guys rightfully get paranoid and scared and they, they'll start feeling their balls compulsively yeah. to see if they have cancer. Yeah. And then that'll make your balls sore if you're always squeezing and touching yeah. them. So yeah. you've got to like, just go to the doctor, get a checkup. It's stupid to not get a checkup. But anyway, I went to the doctor. I still remember that day, man. I'd been writing in this in this cafe yeah. with this in because I'd gone to get a checkup yeah. and I showed this like general practitioner and he's like, Oh, no, that's bad. You need to go to a urologist immediately. So then and that's the last thing you want to fucking hear, man. Yeah. And it's just like any anytime you go to the doctor, 
when you're an immortal, yeah. which is if you're a person who hasn't gotten sick yet, and a lot yeah. of people haven't, right. you're just like, I'm going to walk out of here with a big grin on my face. He's going to see the ball and be like, come on, man, you're yeah. fine. Get yeah. out of here, yeah, champ. Yeah, you're yeah, fine. Yeah. So you're, then it's like you're sitting there. You can feel the like, the fucking, you can just feel this darkness rising into you. It's like, oh, shit, this could be it. This yeah. could be it. This is going to be my thing. Yeah. This is going to be the thing. And so... Then I'm writing at this cafe before I go to the urologist and, and like, I'm, I'm just like, oh, this is probably going to be nothing. I'm going to get in there. It's just nothing. Waste of time. Funny story though. Big cancer scare. I'm going to tell my friends I had a little cancer yeah. scare. Boy, it was scary. Yeah. Really terrified. Yeah. And I'm driving there and then I get there and I, I remember even thinking like, man, you're going to be so relieved when you find out you don't have cancer. And I remember thinking, I'm going to get, I'm going to go buy. Some of those, I don't even know why I thought this, but I've been wanting those LED color changing lights you can control with your iPhone, you yeah, know? Like, yeah. I'm gonna, after this, I'm gonna go buy those crazy fucking lights. Yeah. I don't know why, it'll just be a celebration, cause I'm fine. Yeah. You get there, doctor comes in, show him your ball, he's like, hmm, this, yeah, this is something, we should do an ultrasound for this, right? Right now, we need to do an ultrasound, because this is definitely enlarged. Right. And, they ask these, they're asking you all these questions about yeah. your past. Like, does anyone in your family have cancer? Well, my mom had breast cancer. And then, like, does, um, uh, they just, like, weird. Did your balls descend? That's what they asked. Like, when I was a kid, did my, yeah. I, which they did. But, uh, so then the ultrasound's happening, right? So you're laying on the table. They're using this sonar device to kind of scan your, your balls. You're looking at the lady's face. You can't see the screen. And even if you could, you wouldn't know what you're looking for. But you're looking at the lady's face because you want to see, what her expression is, because you think, if she sees cancer in my ball, she, I'm going to be able to tell in her face. Yeah, she's going to go, oh, fuck. Yeah, Jesus Christ, <laughs> you're dying. But this is they do this all day, yeah, you know? Yeah. So it's just a kind of a blank face, and I'm asking her, how am I doing? Yeah. Looking okay? Yeah. She's like, well, you know, we can't say. It's, yeah. I can't give a diagnosis. Right. And then, uh, then suddenly you're sitting at a desk in front of a doctor. Just like in the fucking movies. Oh boy. When you're sitting at, when your doctor is at the other end of a fucking desk. Yeah. I don't know why they do that. I don't know why they want to fucking sit at a desk when they tell you you have cancer. I don't know well, if that's you want part- them to be holding you? Yeah, I would prefer anything. Just sneak it, sneak it in or something. Like yeah. point, point at something and then right. you have cancer. Right. But yeah, he's like, well, you have, there's a 90% chance that this is cancer. And, uh, we are going to need to schedule a, what's called an orchiectomy. Uh huh. And I'm, where we're gonna cut your balls off and- Both of them? You're one. Yeah. And we're gonna, um, we should do it next week. Yeah. They don't take, you know, they're like, and he's like, and then after this we're gonna send you down to get a CAT scan. And, and, and cause we wanna make sure that it hasn't spread into your lungs or into your brain. Yeah. So that, that's the moment where your hearing goes away. Yeah. That's the moment where this, like, suddenly you can't hear anymore, and it's the weirdest fucking thing, man. Like, it's, you really do have that experience of seeing someone's lips moving, uh-huh. but you can't hear anymore because you now are a person who has cancer, and, like, five minutes before, you thought you weren't. And then you get, they someone escorts you to where you go to get the uh, CAT scan. and Right uh, then, right after you talk to the doctor. Yeah. Because they're like, you have cancer. We have to get this out of you immediately. You yeah. have cancer, so there's no time to delay. Yeah. This is, yeah. this imme- this has to get out of your body. There's no time to delay. I had a fucking, I had shows coming up. I remember asking the doctor, I was like, well, can I put off this surgery until I do the shows? He's like, you have cancer. <laughs> He's like, you you can't delay this thing. <laughs> like, no, because your logical mind is like, well, you know, I'll just put this is something we'll take care of, doc. But I've got to take care of you know business first. Mm-hmm. So this woman escorts you because they know that you're in shock and they know that you're not going to be able to like find your way through Cedar Sinai. So they escort you to where the that you get your cat scan. Yeah. And uh, at the time, I just gotten into a relationship with somebody, so I'm just thinking like, shit, man, is she going to break up with me because I have fucking cancer? Like now, she's, now she's dating a cancer guy, you know. So I'm looking at like a relationship maybe ending on top of my life, maybe. Mm ending and of course getting one of my balls chopped off and just like what's this going to do to my life and then but it's like all these thoughts are swirling through your mind you've got to call your family and tell them you know that this is going to happen and uh so it is i I just can't describe that feeling it's just a feeling of absolute helplessness there is no escape it's that feeling in a dream where you're like experiencing the very worst thing and then you're like i'm gonna wake up and then you wake up and you're like fuck that was awful but i'm fine close one no wake up yeah you don't wake up yeah 
And, and so, and so I think that that was, um, uh, it's that, that, so what ended up happening is that I had actually stage 2A testicular cancer, which meant that a couple of my lymph nodes were enlarged. So could have been cancer. Maybe it wasn't cancer. Didn't matter. After I got my ball chopped off, I had to get radiation therapy for a month. And, uh, that holy shit, man. That is the most fucked up thing. Getting your ball chopped off is like quick, easy. They give you allotted shitloads of Vicodin. You just get to sort of float around your house in like an opiated one ball haze. Yeah. But getting fucking radiation, wow. Every day you've got to drive to this facility. You lay down in this HR Giger looking machine. They play, they were playing like for the longest time they were playing like Gloria Estevan, what's her name? The, just like terrible music yeah. as you're getting irradiated. You're essentially getting your internal organs microwave, but you lay down on this thing where your a, 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 a lead cod piece is placed on your balls and you lay in this thing, you can't move, and the machine sort of like zzz, 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 Robocop style, this giant machine sort of rotates around you, it's scanning you finds the place where the lymph nodes are enlarged and there's this awful clicking noise tick, 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 tick. and then so that's it it's over really quick you put yeah. your clothes on and then right around like 5 p.m you just want to vomit you start feeling so sick and tired and they give you this awful anti-nausea medication that just makes you like just fucking so tired all day long you just feel like you have mono and you want to puke it's like being car sick for a month straight Ugh. that was fucked up man and then after that you have to go in you know every it started off like every two every th- four months every two months you start you go in for all these follow-up scans yeah and then after that you've got to wait a few days to hear if the cancer has returned and spread through your body. So you're always being like, it's not like it ends. Yeah. It's like you're constantly getting this weird exam that you go to where if the doctor said, where if something shows up, you got to get chemo now. Yeah. Your hair is going to fall out. You've got to get fucking chemo. So that again and again pushes your face against your own mortality. Again and again pushes your face into the impermanence of your life and the impermanence of whatever thing that you're doing. Whatever it is that you're doing, whether you're the fucking president, whether you're a janitor, whatever the thing is that you're doing, that thing will immediately get disrupted inevitably by uh, disease, right. which happens to all people. It's, right. it's, it's, it's going to happen. Yeah, it's definitely going to fucking How long have you been clean of it? I just went in for, oh, God, I've, I've been clean of it for about a year, and now I only have to go in once a year, and I just went in for my last uh, chest x-ray, and everything's fine. So now it's once a year I go in and get these tests. So um, Congratulations. Thank you, my friend. But it's the t- t- testicular cancer is the most treatable form of cancer. There's like a 93% cure rate, if not more. So it's just terrifying. I mean, no matter what, it's fucking And then terrifying. when did your mom pass during all this? Well, my mom passed, so that happened uh, while I was right after my radiation therapy ended. So it was sudden, or no? She had breast cancer for years. Oh, sorry. So and it spread into her bones, and then um, horrible. It is horrible. Yeah, it is. It is really fucking horrible. And but it's also exactly what happens in this dimension if you have a human body. You don't get bone cancer necessarily it cancer is terrible but it you're is, gonna leave the vessel you're gonna bury your parents yeah so so that that definitely is going to happen and um all those things man it's like you know sometimes people will say to me oh god man you just had the worst year ever and uh i always think of that charles bukowski poem that it's the broken shoelace that sends a man to the madhouse. Have you yeah. ever read that poem? I don't think so. Oh, it's so great. It's not the big. It's not the. It's not the. It's not the. Uh, the big catastrophe. It's the last straw. It's the little droplets. It's the yeah, Japanese right. water torture of life that's so much more intense. And 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 that's kind of why there's so many. What cli- book is that in? I don't know. It's. Uh, I don't know. I What's no it idea. called? Google search. It's the broken shoelace, Bukowski, and it'll pop up. And this was the one that, that kind of knocked you out? 
This didn't knock me out, but I think this is like, uh, this is to the me. The shoelace, a woman, a tire that's flat, a disease, a desire, fears in front of you, fears that hold so still you can study them like pieces on a chessboard. It's not the large things that send a man to the madhouse. Death he's ready for, or murder, incest, robbery, fire, flood. No, it's the continuing series of small tragedies that send a man to the madhouse. Not the death of his love, but a shoelace that snaps with no time left. The dread of life is that swarm of trivialities that can kill quicker than cancer and which are always there. License plates or taxes or expired driver's license or hiring or firing, doing it or having it done to you or roaches or flies or a broken hook on a screen or out of gas or too much gas. The sink stopped up. The landlord's drunk. The president doesn't care and the governor's crazy. Light switch broken. Mattress like a porcupine. $105 for a tuna carburetor and fuel pump at Sears Roebuck and the phone bills up and the market's down and the toilet chain is broken and the light has burned out the hall light the front light the back light the inner light it's darker than hell and twice as expensive then there's always crabs and ingrown toenails and people who insist they're your friends there's always that and worse leaky faucet Christ and Christmas blue salami nine day rains 50 cent avocados and purple liverwurst or making it as a waitress at norms on the split shift, or as an emptier of bedpans, or as a car wash, or a busboy, or a stealer of old ladies' purses, leaving them screaming on the sidewalks with broken arms at the age of 80. Suddenly, two red lights in your rearview mirror, and blood in your underwear, toothache, and $979 for a bridge, 300 for a gold tooth, and China, and Russia, and America, and long hair, and short hair, and no hair, and beards, and no faces, and plenty of zigzag but no pot except maybe one to piss in and the other one around your gut with each broken shoelace out of 100 broken shoelaces one man one woman one thing enters a madhouse so be careful when you bend over ah <laughs> yeah that's it oh feel better yeah that was cathartic that was great so to finish up here, when this happened to you, you became mindful. Yeah. And your spiritual practice became defined. Yes. And what is that? I just meditate every day. I read and I meditate. I try not to I try not to be reactive to my anger, but when I am, I don't beat myself up over it. I don't think that I'm like what the thing that it's really if it's, if it's given me anything, it's just given me the realization that I'm probably not going to change. You know, it's like gotten rid of that delusion in, in my head. And it's allowed me to really just accept that this is how I am. This is how I am. And sometimes I send shitty texts to people who fucking piss me off. And sometimes I, like, act happier than I am because I want people to think I'm peaceful when I'm not. But sometimes I really am peaceful. It's just a, it's, it's, a, it's an always changing thing. It's just given me a chance, if anything, just to see that. Little individual flakes that are floating around in the snow globe of the self uh, that are often hidden to us can be opened up when you sit down to meditate or run or whatever. It doesn't, you don't have to sit down and meditate. Do whatever. It, the idea is just stop moving for a second. You know, the whole fucking world is moving and moving and moving and moving. And they're always like poking you with some kind of emotional cattle prod to get you to go and go and go and go and go. You don't even know what you're going for. And it's like that idea... That, 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 that realization, like, fuck, you know what? I'm not gonna, like, I don't wanna run around like that anymore. I don't wanna do something just cause I think I should be doing it. If I'm not inspired by something, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna just keep doing it. So, that's what cancer and dying people will teach you really quickly, is it's just the cliche, and all the cliches, all the songs, live like you were dying, all the country songs. It's really true. There's a reason that those cliches emerge, and that's because if you've gotten into this fucking terrible trance and you're flying on co-pilot, or autopilot, rather, you're just running around like some fucking android that's just running this repetitive loop over and over and over and over again so that you're not happy right now and you're not even trying to be happy, you're not even trying to be anything. Look how fast time flies, man. Like, think when you go on vacation. That vacation you've been looking forward to for for six months, 
going to Hawaii for a week. All of a sudden, you're on the plane coming yeah. back from Hawaii. Yeah. You are never even fucking in Hawaii because the entire time that you're waiting to go to Hawaii, you're looking forward to Hawaii into the future. You're habituating yourself to this constantly looking forward to the next thing. You get to Hawaii and suddenly you're supposed to be in the moment. Now you're just thinking about getting the most out of that vacation. Really ring that vacation. Ring the fun out of that fucking vacation. You got to get the most out of it. That's what they teach you. And then suddenly you're on the plane. Well, I think the same thing happens with your fucking deathbed. This whole life, gone. And then suddenly you're like laying on your deathbed, an IV drip of morphine going into your arm. You're in some kind of hazy fog. Whoever you love is maybe sitting next to you. Maybe you're alone. Maybe no one's there. And you think, holy shit, I'm dying. And that's it. So it's like, I don't, I don't want that moment. I don't want to be laying on my deathbed. I'm certainly not living so that I can have a wonderful death experience. But I just want to live before I die. And I know that's a cliche too, but I think there's something to be said for certain cliches. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there, you know, some things are, are repeated. You know, look, I've, I, I think that, that the human experience, you know, in, in a practical sense, when it comes to, uh, to, to life or death is, is, it's a fairly short menu. <laughs> you yes. know, you, that you, you know, there are certain things we know are going to happen and there are certain desires and things that we do to ourselves, but it's not some weird, like huge book of shit. They all fall under the rubric of one or two things. And, and I, and I think what you're saying is true. It, it's like uh, the, the, those things are true for a reason. But you know, again, like we talked about earlier, is you can wrap your brain around it, but to wrap your being around it is not going to happen until they wrap themselves around you. Uh, yeah, that's true. It's good to talk to you, man. Great to talk to you too, Mark. Thank you so much. What a blast. Thanks, Duncan. Love talking to that guy. Testicular cancer, people. Check your balls. All right. One more time with this. Um, it's the last time I'm going to tell you. Watch Sirens tonight on USA Network. It's a new comedy series created by Dennis Leary of Rescue Me and Bob Fisher, co-writer of Wedding Crashers. Sirens is about three EMTs who are great at their jobs, but not so great at everything else. Funny things can happen when you save lives for a living. Sirens, a new USA original series, Thursdays at 10, 9 central, only on USA Network. All right, so you know what to do. Go to WTFPod.com if you'd like. Get the app if you're new to the show and you want to listen to all 400 and however many are there. You can get the free app, upgrade to the premium, and then stream all of them. Leave some comments. You know, get into it with the douchebags there. I didn't. I don't know what to do with them. There's some real garbage coming out of people, especially when they're women on this show, and it's disgusting. You're disgusting. You should check yourselves. Uh, what else? JustCoffee.coop, available at WTFPod.com. Check my schedule. I'm going to be in uh, Cleveland. Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina is coming up. Moon Tower Comedy Fest. I'm going to be at the uh, Wild West Comedy Festival interviewing Vince Vaughn in a one-on-one WTF at a theater. That should be fun. Uh, what else? What else? Oh, my God. I'm exhausted. <sighs> Boomer lives. Hey folks, it's Thursday, and that means tonight is the night for Sirens on the USA Network. It's the new original comedy series created by Dennis Leary of Rescue Me and Bob Fisher of Wedding Crashers. Thursday is always a great night for comedy, and so the USA Network has got you covered with a new show for you to get hooked on. Sirens, a new USA original series, Thursdays at 10, 9 central, only on USA Network. All right, let's do this, folks. Let's do the show now. Yeah. Lock the gate! <laughs> All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers, what the fuck buddies, what the fucking ears, what the fuck sticks, what the fuckadelics, what the fuckle heads, what the fuckle bunnies? I am Mark Marin. This is WTF. Thank you for listening to my show. I'm happy you're here. I appreciate you being here. I'm thrilled today to present to you a conversation with the uh, with the uh, thoughtful and and trippy Duncan Trussell, Duncan Trussell, who uh, who I've known for a while. Uh, we've hung out a couple of times. I always enjoy him. He's a very he's he's a pleasant, uh, thoughtful man, curious, intelligent, hilarious. Duncan 
is a comedian. He used to do this trippy thing with a puppet that I that I enjoyed. It was out there, man. But at the time, he was briefly worked at the comedy store, and uh, he was the guy responsible, you know, 20 years after the fact, for getting my name painted on the wall. And I will talk to him about that. I will. I'm glad so many of you enjoyed the Lane and Dunham episode. A lot of... Uh, a lot of conversation instigated around that. And I gotta say, uh, some of you who comment on the comment board are disappointing. Disappointing humans. I don't always know if it's the greatest thing in the world that we have the freedom to share the absolute worst kind of unbridled, unfiltered, thoughtless, impulsive garbage anytime we want to. And anonymously. Don't know if it's always a great thing. Look, I'm all for freedom. I'm all for freedom of speech. But some of you guys are just, just fucking horrendous people. And you know I'm not talking to you if I'm not talking to you. It just amazes me that on my comment board that, you know, it's not even that, it's not even a heavy traffic situation ever. Except when there's women on it. And then these garbage heads come out of nowhere to dump garbage into the feed. Just pure misogynistic, intolerant garbage. I don't know who they are or whether they seek it out or whether they're actual listeners or what. But it, it only happens when women are on the show. And there was some good backlash to it on the on the comment board. And, uh, you know, I, I was happy to see that. I don't get engaged with it. I do read it occasionally. I find it disappointing. I don't know who the fuck these people are sometimes. It's just ridiculous that that it only happens when women are on the show. Hey, if you're going to take a dump on somebody just because you've got problems with yourself, why don't you spread it around a little bit? Do it to all the shows if you're going to be that person. You know what I mean? We have a new sponsor today. It's called Harry's. And let me tell you a little bit about why Harry's exists. This guy, Andy, went to the drugstore. He waited like 10 minutes for someone to unlock the case where the razors were being held. He bought a four-pack of blades and some shaving cream. Then he goes to checkout and drops 25 bucks on these blades he didn't really like. And he spent a long time buying them. So Andy and his buddy Jeff decided to make a better way for people to buy the stuff they need. Yeah, okay, sounds good. Harry's gives guys a great shaving experience at half the price of stuff from the drugstore. Fifteen bucks gets you a razor, three blades, and shave cream shipped to your door. Harry's even offers a custom engraving option to engrave your initials on the razor, and you get the convenience and ease of ordering all this online. I got a shaving kit from Harry's. All the stuff was there. It was shipped directly to my house. No trip to the drugstore necessary for some overpriced blades. Go to harrys.com and use the promo code WTF, and Harry's will throw in a free four-pack of blades with your first purchase for all WTF listeners. Just add a four-pack of blades into your shopping cart, and they won't cost you a thing. That's harrys.com, promo code WTF. Yeah, man, I hit a wall with humanity. I hit a wall with humanity the other day. Sometimes I'm on Twitter, I hit a wall with humanity. I'm on my comment board, I hit a wall. Just people spewing garbage because they can anonymously. Horrendous. I had problems with Time Warner, so I took it to the people. I took it to the streets. I tweeted my problems with Time Warner because if they want to have a Twitter presence then they're asking for that. That's exactly what they want. They think this is a way to save customers, to get more customers. Hey, we got to be on a social networking platform. All right, there you are. That is not a customer service representative. That is somebody representing a company on a social networking platform. I don't. I can't believe that in this, in the world we live in, that there's such this weird kind of like cynical apathy when it comes to corporate monopolies. Ted, that's the way it is, you know, man up, that's the way it is, you get fucked even though you're paying for it, that's just, that, that's how it is, that weird kind of like, almost nihilistic surrender of your will to something you're fundamentally almost anti-American, it's bizarre, corporate apologists, hey quit whining, fuck you, fuck you, you know, you should always fucking call out garbage companies any way you can i don't know why the fuck we've made so many compromises around speaking out around you know the bullshit that we can speak out about so after all is said and done i have no idea if that had anything to do with anything but last night my internet was fast as fuck and i'm, I'm wary 
uh, to thank Time Warner. Maybe you know, maybe it did have something to do. Maybe they did snap to it. I see. That's the thing. Where's the guy that calls and says we took care of that for you, Mister Marin? We understood you were upset about that. We got a guy out there immediately. Even if whoever the motherfucker that was downloading porn and Netflix and 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 uploading an entire music library simultaneously for the last five nights, who probably clogged the fucking node, so no one in this area could use it. Even if that guy exists out there, why don't they take credit? That's good business. That just shows you that their customer service is really crap if they don't have a guy that calls and goes, oh, I saw that your Internet's working. Yeah, we took care of that for you. We worked all night on that, man. We had a guy up there on the pole for three hours because we wanted you to feel better. That's the job they should be concerned about. Where's that guy? Hey, uh, before I forget, another reminder, USA Network presents Sirens, a new original series, Thursdays at 10, 9 central. That's tonight, people. Only on USA Network. They're calling this a life or death situation comedy from executive producers Dennis Leary and Bob Fisher. Dennis is an executive producer on my show, Marin, which premieres May 8th. I'll slip that in. So I trust his judgment when it comes to TV comedies. Sirens is about three EMTs who are great at their jobs, but not so great at everything else. You've got Johnny, a sports-loving Chicago EMT, working with his best friends, Hank, and they've taken Brian under their wing, a wide-eyed and excitable new EMT who still lives with his parents. Funny things happen when he saves lives for a living. Sirens, a new original series, Thursdays at 10, 9 central, immediately following a new episode of the hit series, Suits. Oh, for those of you who are concerned about my cats, uh, I've got an update. In just a nick of time, I got the suture out of my cat's face. I don't know how I did it. I was paralyzed with fear. I was approaching this cat as if I were about to ride a bull. I think I had the same level of fear within the context of my life when I would consider wrapping the cat in a blanket or a towel, holding the cat down, pulling the cat's head back. This is a vicious, wild cat at heart. There's no peace in this cat. No peace at all. She pretends to be peaceful when she wants some love or a little a little touching when she needs to eat. But other than that, wild fucking animal. No peace at heart. No peace of mind. Even looks in her eyes. You know, there's a comfort there for a minute. And then there's just sort of like, I am going to fucking rip you to shreds if you fuck with me at all. That's who my cat is inside. So it's like riding a bull, folks. But I don't know, like every day I tried to approach her and she'd freak out. Got to the point where she knew I was coming. I'd see the clipper in my hand. It was just, it was ridiculous. And the, it was straining our relationship. I didn't know if we would ever recover from her suspicion. And I don't know what happened yesterday. I'm, you know, I, I gotta, I gotta travel. And yesterday I just, I grabbed her by the scruff of the neck. I pulled her head back and just held it. And I clipped that thing off. And I didn't have to take her to the vet. I thought I was gonna have to take her to the vet. And by the way, I know a lot of you heard about the earthquake, but I lived through it. Not only, not only did I live through it, I almost slept through it. I woke up, and this is, I've been through enough earthquakes now where I woke up, and, uh, you know, moon was there, and we both stood there, and she went, earthquake. I'm like, yep, earthquake, just, just hang out a minute. And I just felt it, got a sense of it, got a feeling for its duration, didn't get out of bed. That's how I handled the earthquake. Generally, if you feel it really going deep, you know, I, I don't know about this doorway business or bathtubs or anything else. For me, if you're in a neighborhood that doesn't have a lot of tall buildings and not a lot of power wires around, get the fuck out of the house. Go far from structure. So structure do not fall on you. That's my feeling. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm, I, I'm probably wrong. I'm sure if I'm not reading a guidebook, but that's my impulse. That thing could fall down. I'm going to move away from it. I'm going to move away from any possibility of being hit with heavy shit. So, made it through that. All right, look, I know I'm a little edgy. I'm still a little sick. Uh, I enjoy talking to you people. And it's my pleasure right now to uh, to talk to Duncan Trussell. Uh, I hope you enjoy this. I had a very nice time with Duncan. Today, today I... Uh, what is the routine, Duncan? Well, the routine is I, I wake up. Walk my dog. Yeah. Down by the LA River. What kind of dog? A little Chihuahua. You have a Chihuahua? A Chihuahua Jack Russell mix. Did you inherit that? I adopted. You adopted the dog. Fox. From 
Huh? His name's Fox. His name's Fox. Yeah. You adopted it on your own, not with the girl. No, on my own. Okay. Can you believe that? This is the first time I've never had a meat handcuff between me and another person. There's yeah. always a pet yeah. lassoing me to somebody yeah. forever. Yeah. Well, I mean, until the breakup. Is that true? You had dogs with women that, that you had to share custody of? Is that what you're no, saying? No, no shared custody. I had a dog, two dogs with Natasha. Right. And I, when I left, I just thought, well, That's who the over. fuck would want to go stay with me? These dogs should stay with, with Natasha. Her? And I just didn't want to, I, it seems like that thing, like skulking over to your, I mean, I can understand with kids. But yeah. Skulking over to your ex-girlfriend's house to yeah. like pet your dog. That just seems so pathetic. No, I don't. I, yeah, I, I believe that's true. I mean, I, I love the dog, but if the dog is well cared for, you're going to have to let that dog go. You got to let it go. I mean, some people think that way about kids. I don't necessarily agree with that. You know, that kid will be fine without me. Probably be better off without me. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know about that. I don't either. I don't know. So you got this little girl dog. Me now? A girlish dog. How dare you? Are you I'm calling gonna, my dog girlish? I don't know. It's a chihuahua. A chihuahua? Chihuahua. 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 A chihuahua. Gr- girlish dog. Holy shit, man. I never knew it. I didn't, what? I didn't know you were sexist. I thought you were completely open-minded. But I'm very you, open-minded. How dare you assign gender traits to an animal? That is not cool. My dog, by the way, is more masculine than I am. Much I, I think I was actually assigning those traits to you. Oh. That, that was... <laughs> You know, dog is a dog, but that was a dog I'm more accustomed to seeing perhaps as a, an accessory for a, for a woman who might be walking down the street. Listen like to a- you! Listen to you, man. That's what women do. They carry chihuahuas around in purses. I didn't say purses. You just said that. So <laughs> You got me! <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I think it's... I like... Look, I'm a cat person. What do I know? Well... I had dogs. Did you grow up with dogs? Yeah, I grew up with dogs. How many dogs? Let's see. We had Georgia, and then there was Jenny. Yeah. And that's... That was it? Those are the two. But where the hell do you come from? Like, the first time I met you, you were you were booking the comedy store. Yes. You were this strange. Your hair always seemed a little dirty to me. Yeah. Uh, you didn't have a beard or mustache. Yeah. You had kind of a, a weird vibe that was always a, a little slightly tweaked. But I liked you. Yeah. Uh, my experience with the comedy store goes way back, and you were sort of uh, like, I was like, well, how integrated is he into this situation? Is he uh, is he part of it? Is he an extension of it? Yeah. Uh, did it invent him? Mm. And then, uh, but you were the guy that got my name on the wall. Oh, you, I did? Yeah, you're the one who made that happen. For uh, my entire life, I did not have my name on the wall, and you somehow took care of that. Am I wrong in saying that? Uh, you're wrong in saying that. I mean, I wish I could take credit for I it. I believe but... you did. Why do you, why do you say no? I mean, when I came back around, it wasn't on the wall and you were booking the place. Well, I was the guy who made the phone call, but at the time, Mitzi was running everything. So I, I really, it wasn't like I had some. Who put it in her head that my name wasn't on the wall? Well, see, that's the thing, man. You think you're the only comic who was like freaking out because their name wasn't on the wall? Like, I wasn't freaking out though. But, well, a lot of comics thought like look at that as like a big achievement yeah. so you would get this sort of like a, a drizzle of phone calls right. throughout the week yeah with <laughs> just every once in a while some yeah. lost comic going yeah. what's the deal yeah yeah for for real what do i gotta do yeah yeah once i called a comic and told them mitzi wanted them to come and paint their name off the wall <laughs> who was that i think it was vicky barbalock remember her? i don't even know why i did it like out of nowhere yeah let's see with the few marbles so, she has left you get so bored up there man when i was working there you're up in the top of the fucking comedy store it's like having an office in the haunted mansion so yeah you just get bored up there and, and you're talking to comedians all day <laughs> yeah, so it's, yeah. you're just talking to like the nation's weirdest people on earth all day long so you definitely can get a little tweaked out in that situation but what well, I don't understand. She uh, so you were dealing with Mitzi before she went all, before she left entirely in a way. Oh yeah, yeah. I was with her when she was she was. Comp- I mean, I I don't know how she is now, but when I was there, it was. Was she sick yet? She was sick. Yeah, right. She was sick. And before I was the talent coordinator, I was the runner. So I would. Dr- I did that job. No way. Sure. Were you, well, you had to get her a chicken salad. Oh well, I had to. Yes, you get her chicken cow tongue sandwich. Cow tongue. Oh really? Yeah. So you had to go where to Cantor's? Where do they have? Or where Nate and Al's? Where do you get cow tongue? It was. It was. I think it was Cantor's. Uh-huh. I don't remember that. No, it was some grocery store around where she lived. 
But it was just, I remember the first time I went to pick that up, you know, uh-huh. and get me a cow tongue. And that's some, that's some old Jew shit there, buddy. It just seems like, it seems like, like old Satanist shit, you know, when you're going to pick up a cow tongue, like it feels like you're getting implements for some kind of yeah. diabolic But then ritual. when you see that it's like thinly sliced cow tongue that, that is on a sandwich, does it still reek of Satan to you? Not anymore. <laughs> Especially when I tasted it. <laughs> it wasn't bad, right? It wasn't bad at all. No. So you come out to L.A. from where? From North Carolina. So you grew up in the South? Yes. That was your life? Yeah. I mean, kind of. I mean, I didn't grow up in the South. I, I, I Raleigh? I, well, I bounced around a bunch. I just say North Carolina because that's where I went to high school and junior high school. Yeah. But my folks uh, got divorced, and before that, they were always traveling around. So I, uh, I was in Georgia. I've been in Texas. I was in Chattanooga. Tennessee, I was in, you know, uh, Maryland, Maryland. Uh huh. So a lot of bouncing around. Because you were with who? Well, this was when, when my parents were married. Mm-hmm. I think they had a pretty tumultuous, uh, marriage and were always moving around. Cause that happens when people are sort of unstable. You know, yeah. you go from one place to the next looking for, I guess, a job that, uh-huh. you, that you could live on, feed kids with. How many kids were there? Me and my brother. So how old is he? Younger or older? He, he's older. Oh, really? Yeah. Is he around? He's around, yeah. Yeah? How'd he turn out? Great. Yeah? Yeah, he just had a baby. Oh, so yeah. you're an uncle. I'm an uncle. First time? Yep. That's exciting. Yeah, it's great. Where's he at? He's in Maryland. So it was really, but you had this sort of like Southern American experience in a way. Texas. Uh, yeah. Georgia. Mm-hmm. Uh, North Carolina. It's yeah. pretty. It's rural. Yes. It's deeply rooted in the, uh, in the history of our country. Mm, yeah. Did you feel that? Well, no, I never <laughs> felt that. <laughs> it was, it was nice. I mean, it's beautiful to be around trees and the yeah. forest and it was, it was really cool. But, and of course there's the, you know, stereotypical rednecks. Yeah. Uh, for sure. But. Did you go to school with those guys? Yeah. <laughs> but that was during the undocumented acid boom of the nineties. So. The undocumented one. I think it was undocumented. Yeah. yeah well, let's document it. Tell yeah. me, when did that start? Did well, you start it? I wish. No, I had I had nothing to do with it, unfortunately. But there was a, a it used to be there was a time when it was very easy to obtain LSD. Yeah. And uh, that was when I was in high school. Yeah. And you could sort of it was when the Grateful Dead was touring. You know, the Grateful towards the end of it. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you, they sort of in their wake they left just vials and sheets of acid. You know, in every town that they went. Were through. you following the dead? I went to one dead show. I never followed them. I only went to two. What year are we talking? Uh, this was when I was in high school, 94? I'm not so, sure. I'd, I'd have to go back. I don't know when that would be. Was that towards the end of Jerry? Yes. Wow. Yeah. That was towards the end. Yeah. So was that a mind-blowing experience? Not, not the show. What right. was a mind-blowing experience was the parking lot. The parking lot was just... <laughs> Crazy. Holy shit. What the <laughs> fuck is this, man? Yeah, yeah. You would see like, you know... Kids on skateboards holding cases of beer, and they're like, "Beer for sale, beer yeah. for sale." And yeah. then they get by your car, and they're like, "Acid doses, doses, acid. doses, yeah. doses." Whoa! Everyone's yeah. just selling acid and yeah. mushrooms and yeah. nitrous oxide, and you end up like, "Well, we." Ooh, nitrous! I, I haven't uh, got a sort of weird kind of buzz from a word in a while, but nitrous. That's the oh man! Yeah. You're yeah. hearing the universal oh. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, there, I think the guy who there was someone who's famous for for I, he didn't invent it, but someone who started inhaling it back when there was that uh, burst of spiritualism in the United States. And yeah. He thought that you could inhale nitrous oxide and talk to dead people. He thought it was a way to like commune. You got to you got to keep inhaling it and pacing yourself <laughs> yeah. because you know if you're gonna have a conversation with a dead person on nitrous, you got about a, maybe a forty second window. <laughs> hey, <to> really, hey <laughs> are you okay? Yeah. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> You better talk quick, because you're re-entering. Yeah, we had a tank in uh, my uh, my roommates had a tank when I was in college, like a full tank that they had gotten from some dental supply house. Yeah, and we used to fill garbage bags up with it, and it was just it was kind of a tragic thing to watch. Really, not as tragic as heroin or another thing, but you know, just people sitting on a couch yeah. with garbage bags filled with nitrous, going <sighs> until they then they sort of drift off, and all the nitrous would go out of the bag. Yeah. But uh, yeah. but it, it, your coloring is not great when you're doing that. No, your fucking lips turn blue. It's, <laughs> it, it's it's awful. That's where the term fishing came from. Did you know that fish? No. 
So there, the, so there was a term called fishing, which was that after you had inhaled pharmaceutical grade nitrous oxide yeah. and had then passed out onto the parking lot, right. you would begin to have a mild seizure. And right. that seizure was called like a fish flopping around. Right. And that was the name for someone who had OD'd on nitrous oxide. And that's where fish came from? I I assume, but I don't know. So you're speculating. I'm speculating. Because you I'm came no into idea. this with a little bit of confidence. Well, I, I, have, I don't have confidence about my fish knowledge. <laughs> All right. I know. You started it. I, know, I, went to, I did go to a fish concert, but I didn't like it. No, I, I have no idea what they are. But I did put on American Beauty for you before we came out here. And we locked in. I know yeah. I can speak Grateful Dead to a certain degree. I'm a big fan. That song is so great, man. Box of Rain. Box of Rain. Broke Down uh, Palace is, is my song. Oh, God. That kills me. Every I mean, I, time you break up, it's Elliot Smith and then mix in Broke Down Palace. That, uh, is, the, that is the break the, up mix. Yeah, if you want to cry. Uh, so wait, now this is, you are sort of a, 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 no, a known um, drug warrior. Mm-hmm. And so this time in your life, how old were you when you, when you first did acid? I was in the 10th grade when I first did acid. Now, was that something that changed everything? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, yeah, I did. What were you doing before that? Well, I mean, you're going to high school. Like, yeah. So what are you you're doing? You're trying to figure it out. You're trying to figure it out, but it's also, I mean, the, the thing about high school is it's a, it's, a, it's essentially, it's an internment camp for, teenagers where you're being forced to sit down and like get all this information injected into your brain by people who maybe don't even want to be doing what they're doing some of them do but there's just this sense of like it's just this sense of claustrophobic dread that it induces in, yeah. in kids do you but, see an alternative would to you, that yeah to going to high school yeah, what would you prefer I think that well, I would prefer teachers to make as much as doctors in right. some fantasy world. That's right. that if there was so they'd be into it because there are teachers that somehow get through. Like there was maybe one or two in high school that was like, all right, they're still you know into it for the most part, and they'll resonate. They can change your life. Yes, but uh, so you just think that instead of an internment camp, if we could make it something that we were excited to do and people were excited to share. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be good. That would be... But you're not for no schooling at all, just, you know, at age 10, like, good luck with everything. We don't need no education, <laughs> bro. <laughs> 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 what am I going to learn, man, that I don't already know? Yeah, man, just look at a sunflower. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I think that education is, is the greatest thing. I think a, a sad thing is people, what, what happens when you, like get shoved into those places and you're getting bullied and, and, and like. Oh yeah, the dynamic, the hierarchy, uh, the, uh, the weird, uh, caste system almost. Yeah, it's brutal. And, and then, so then all of a sudden you get this awful, it's the same, like learning is one of the most psychedelic, crazy things. Oh, yeah, yeah. It just, if you find the right book or even just read the right chapter. Change everything. Everything changes. Yeah. Could uh, be a paragraph. A paragraph. Yeah. Why are you like you are? There's a paragraph in a book, and it's fucking changed everything. It's magic. Yeah. It's yeah. And 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 what ends up happening is that people begin to associate learning with being sitting in uncomfortable desks with somebody kicking the back of your, uh, kicking you. I, 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 yeah. I got nothing, nothing connected. I don't know how to do anything I learned in high school. Yeah. I mean, a few things may have connected, but I slept a lot. During class, yes, uh, I read maybe one or two stories that were good. I had one teacher that was great because we wrote poetry, and I found that I I did that, and it was a very profound experience to me. But for the most part, it was just trying to survive in the social structure of high school, yes, and feeling very uncomfortable, yeah, and it, throwing up places, throwing up, sure. That was a big thing in, in all public schools. People are always puking. That's well, I mean, just going out and drinking and getting oh, sick. And, no, no, I wasn't puking at school. You don't want to be that kid. No, where yeah. they throw down the sawdust. Something, uh, something happened. And kids are looking to see what oh, was yeah. in it. And like then they, forever, you're that kid. Who pu well, we had a kid. There was a kid when I was in elementary school yeah. who had the awful problem that if he saw someone mix food together, he would throw up. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like every lunch, somebody would mix food in front of him, and he, you'd always hear him like, "No, please, just don't do it." <laughs> sad plea, <laughs> sad plea, <laughs> don't mix the peas with the potatoes. Here we go. <laughs> that poor guy. I wonder if he still like that. No. Some people cannot 
mix food on a plate. It's just it's like a, a, a cardinal sin to them. He got really badly addicted to painkillers, I think. And what like, else uh, are you going to do with that problem? <laughs> I know. You can't get through a meal with anybody. There's, take something to take you the edge off. Inject a lot of just, <laughs> just to eat a hamburger with someone else across from you, because they might stick some uh, French fries and ketchup, and you're going to be fucking <laughs> over. So, what was the uh, the well? What's your what, what kind of business was uh, your family in? Well, my mom was a psychologist. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And and my dad was a, uh, he ran a shopping center. Like a, like a strip mall? Yeah. Yeah? In Mobile, Alabama. In Mobile, Alabama. Yeah. This is after the divorce. Uh-huh. Before that, he was a lot of different things. He was one of those guys? Yeah. What's dad doing this week? Yeah. What were some of the, uh, what was the list? It was always involved, he always worked at like real estate offices. And, Commercial real estate? Yeah, in right. the South, you know, right. like, or business, yeah, business, yeah, business real estate. Right, and right. So yeah, that was part of going to visit him was, you know, he would try to, his idea was to like turn us into men. Yeah. So he would like give us just these shitty fucking jobs yeah. working for his, company yeah you know like in the south like chopping fucking shrubs in the in in the south all day yeah always fending off molestation what do you mean fending off molestation there was just this weird old guy who like worked down in the shop where i had to work yeah and like i can remember it was just this bad vibe i got from him and like he was always getting a little too close to me and then like at one point he's like i got a pacemaker he's like put your ear to my mouth listen listen and like opened his mouth and like i didn't put my ear in his mouth but like did you hear the ocean yeah you heard the ocean screaming <laughs> <laughs> get me out of this perverted old man <laughs> what did you hear when you stuck your ear to his mouth i heard my own adrenaline just like what's happening like why is this happening to me he says like my pacemaker sounds like a little bird <laughs> <laughs> that is the weirdest. Yeah. I guess if you're a little kid, you're like, nah, <laughs> that you might do that. Yeah, but he, um. Is that the end of the memory? That's, well, no, actually, I, I trapped some cats that summer. There was like some stray cats, mm-hmm. and kittens, and like I trapped them and then took them back home, but then they were feral and I couldn't. What's that got to do with the old man? I don't know, Mark. All right, same period. It happened in the same, same period. period. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's your dad's doing. Yeah, well, I don't think it's my dad's doing. I don't blame my dad. That's just the world. You yeah, know? but he set you up with the gig. He just—he was trying to get show me what hard work was like. I guess. But it doesn't sound like he was doing it. <laughs> <That's funny>. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean he's working at a desk. Exactly. I wish I'd thought of that when I was when he was like when we were driving through a Hardee's drive-through at six a.m. and I knew I had to go chop weeds for the day. <laughs> he's going to sit out somewhere. What a great make a couple phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> so your mom was a clinical psychologist? Yes. Really? Yeah. Hippie style or straight up? Um, I'm going to say hippie style. Uh-huh. For uh-huh. sure. Yeah? Hippie style, yeah. So you had the books around? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. How do you know about the books? Well, which ones? Which ones did you get into? Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Is that what you're sure. talking about? Well, sure. That, that falls under hippie psychology. Sure. Yeah. You know, that, those kinds of books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh... Jack Cornfield, of course, Ram Dass. Like, yeah. I really got in. I still love. She Ram had the Ram Dass books. Well, she had these cassette tapes. Uh-huh. Like, you remember when they used to like they they used to have like these weird like I don't know plastic containers filled with like an audio yeah, lecture yeah, yeah. series. Yeah, 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 sure, so sure, she had sure. Those, with so. no labels on them, just to, like one Ram Dass at so and so. Yes. Like, one and then two. And exactly. Then, yeah, yeah. That was it. So we would uh. listen to those in the car as like as we drove and and. I didn't really care for it at the time. Like I wanted would, to listen to music. Well, yeah, and I just didn't want to do anything my mom was doing. So yeah. that, so she I was the enemy. Y- yeah, not yeah. the other guy. Not my dad. Huh. No, it was my mom. My mom and I had a really like uh-huh. on like turbulent sort of relationship. It isn't interesting? You seem to be more in the groove of what she inspired now. Yeah. Than than uh, the opposite. You're not doing commercial real estate. You're you know. You're well, thinking you, about Satanism and listening to Manson records. <laughs> that's not like that's not what my mom did. But the antidote, a journey the, of the mind, is what I'm saying. That a journey antidote, of the mind. Yeah. Well, I I I love. I'm not going to say I don't like listening to Manson records or hey, reading well, about very, Charles Manson. Uh, very, one of the great entertainers of the 20th century. Really was man. Yeah. One of the great performance artists. Yeah. Oh, and unbelievable. Truly an, a staple of yeah. American. Real history. risk taker. 
Yeah, real risky. He went for it. He sure did go he for it. He fucking went for it, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you got the books. So that's where must have, something must have gotten through then, listening to that 60s shit, right? Well, I think that... How old are you? I'm 39. All right, so they were probably just a little older than me. Wow, yeah, I guess so. Because I'm 50. Yeah, yeah, right. I guess so. So they were actual boomers. They probably, you know, kind of what muddled through the 60s and all that explosion somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. That's right. So your mom picked up on that kind of like, you know, we can make it a good place if we change our minds no. business. My mom didn't pick up. My mom, what happened is my mom went through a divorce and... Um, and then somewhere after that, she started finding out about this stuff. She wasn't a hippie. Uh-huh. She was, it's a, our, our family on her side is a very traditional Southern family. So the, really, yes, she wasn't a hippie. As far as I am aware, when, when she married my dad, I don't think she became a hippie then. It was when we came to North Carolina that she started coming into contact with that stuff. And she was ready to rebel in a way. Cause what your parents, like they met and they were both kind of regular Southern conservative people. And then the divorce kind of fucked her head up? Yeah. Yes. Right. I think so. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. that's what happens is you... I mean, I think that happens to, to so many people is they don't consider the... They don't even think about why they're getting married. And yeah. back then, right. you didn't even think, like, why right. would I get married or right. do this? You just do it. Let alone have kids. Well, look what we did. Yeah. Now what? Yeah. Yeah. And then suddenly, the thing starts curdling and falling apart. And it's not like now, where everyone gets... Where getting married is just a sort of... I yeah. don't know what it is. I'm not sure either. Back then, it was a... It was a, a very serious thing. And so then, when the, the divorce falls apart, you end up with two fucking kids. And you've... That's a wonderful contact with truth. And I think whenever you come in contact with truth, sometimes it'll push you in the direction of trying to, you know, understand uh, how to get closer to that facet of the universe. And a lot of those books help you do that in a way that I th- I don't think they teach you anywhere else. So when you say truth is a facet of the universe, which one were you referring to? Children? Imp- impermanence. Mm-hmm. Oh, you mean that it, it ends? Yeah, that it not it not just that it ends, but yeah, everything ends. Yeah, like everything. Some ends. faster than others. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly. A, it's a matter of pacing and timing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you. I mean, it's it's even like you know, even the way you feel like right now. That's yeah. going to change. Like everything's in this constant state of flux, and right. it's in the in the whole. It seems like the one of the aspects of living in the west is that you're taught that things don't really change or that you should expect things to stay the same but you're looking for 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 some security yes and some uh some context that uh, that will make you feel like well th- this is my life now yeah i'm in it everything's changing yeah always always and you just got to live with that why fight it yeah you know that we're you know you're not going to stop it you know we're fighting entropy here that's There's exactly no- right yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're not just fighting. I mean, it's funny because we are entropy. It's I like know. we're entropy fighting itself. And I'm, that- I'm breaking apart right now. <laughs> I'm watching you vaporize in front of me. <laughs> it's amazing to see. I only do it for certain people. <laughs> it's so cool. I thought you could do that. <laughs> you can aerosolize yourself. That's amazing. Yeah, it took a lot of practice. Wow. It happened by accident. I had uh. gas, and then I found like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, like, let's track the mind-blowing because, I mean, at some point, you started thinking about things in a different way. I, I, I think when I met you, you were still doing the puppet thing. Yeah. And that was the big bit. But it was a pretty creepy bit. Yeah. And you were sort of hung up, I, I imagine, because you were into the comedy. So I could tell by the look in your eyes that you were, it had hold on you. Mm-hmm. So, so you, you, you sort of felt the tangible darkness of the place. Yes. And, and felt that you were part of that. Yes. And then at some point, you extricated yourself. And became a more you you fought the forces of darkness, contextualized them, and freed yourself somehow. But in order to have the tools for that, uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, <laughs> it's great. I love it. I wish I, I'm gonna have to go back and listen to that and get it. It'll be available on my stomach. <laughs> Extricate yourself from the darkness. <laughs> get a handle on it. Yeah. But I mean, but when did uh, you first start dealing with, um, you know, a more cosmic approach to things? I mean, at what point? I mean, Ram Dass didn't affect you in the car, and then you took acid in 10th grade, but where did you start, where did you, your brain start to kind of blow open? Yeah, you know, man, the funny thing about that is anytime you think you're, you've, oh yeah, my brain's really gotten blown open, 
it, it's I don't know. I I don't want to seem like I'm dodging that question. I don't know the answer to that. And I think that some sometimes the way uh spiritual growth works is it's a very 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 slow process and um sometimes people f- do this classic thing where they start pretending to be spiritual or something you know like they like well yeah or they grab at fragments uh there there's a lot of that i i know somebody i'm not saying it's a negative thing but to actually grasp something intellectually that you can make sense of does not mean that you can connect it to your heart or whatever you call the 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 soul or its or its connection to the the universe at large. Right. You can sort of like, oh, I get it, but you don't really get it right. until it gets you. Yes, yes, yes. That's it exactly, man. That's exactly right. Yeah. So you see, the whole thing is kind of like a um, uh, you end up. Ever, I my in the beginning when I was really getting into this stuff yeah. and like reading Be Here Now or reading the Bhagavad Gita. Or Where, like, when was this? How many years ago? Well, this uh, this would have been in high school when okay. I first came in contact. So with who it gave a you bit. that? Who gave you the Bhagavad the, Gita? Before the Bhagavad Gita, it was the, was it a guy at a mall who was a shaved head? Uh, no, but I I'll t- I I did hang out with the Hare Krishnas for a while and yeah, I'll, it's good I, food. Well, and it's yeah. great fucking food, man. <laughs> and it's trippy, man. Yeah. That is some trippy All right, so wait, shit. Let's, we'll get there. So yeah, so I um uh so the first contact I guess would have been there was a book my mom had called Raja Yoga uh-huh. by Yogi Ramacharaka, and uh-huh. I still remember it's a blue book. Really fancy looking, and it yeah. had on the on the spine a circle with a triangle in it. And Ooh, it symbols! Seemed, whoo, yeah, very symbolic, yeah. man. What does that mean? What could it mean? Yeah. So then I started reading it, and that's the first time that I ever uh, really, like, I guess I may have come in contact with the idea, but the first time I really came into contact with the idea that you're not your thoughts, or right. that oh, right, 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 your attachment to your thoughts, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, the idea that that what you think defines your personality, or that you are this ego, uh, is a delusion. Yeah. And so that was in this book, and the book had all these different exercises you could do that were designed to sort of take you out of the concept of you. So this was like a magic a, book, in a, a way. What do you, well, I mean, did you, in the sense that like. Here are these exercises, which for most practical purposes are rituals to facilitate this idea that you had just gleaned. Did you do the exercise? I did one of the exercises. What was it? So the exercise is you begin to refer to yourself in the third person, whatever you're doing. Like when you're walking around, you're just like, he is going to his car. He is sitting down. He is driving. He is listening to the radio. He feels sad. He feels happy. Uh And so this is just like, there's a lot of different versions of, of that exercise but the, the, it's designed to sort of cause you to zoom out a little right, bit right. from yourself and, right uh another great practice which i just read about which is really fun uh, and they say this is like the first thing that and i can't remember which sect of buddhism it is but when you become a monk yeah the first question they ask you is where are where are you in your body yeah tell me where you are in your body are right. you are you your hand or are you in your heart are you your feelings find yourself in your body and right. then the more you sort of meditate on that, you realize, fuck, man, I'm not in my... Bo- I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. not here. No, no, I'm just a puppet for something bigger. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, and and I hadn't I hadn't uh, um, ever read anything like that before, and so I think that was probably the beginning of it for me. When you when that that yoga, what's it called? The Raja it was yoga? called the the uh, Raja, Raja, Raja yoga? yoga by Yogi Ramachaka, who was a by the way turned out to be some English guy named like. Stephen Williams or something. Yeah. I looked it up later. He was just called himself Yogi Ramacharaka. Why not? He would sell books. Sure, man. The you know the you know hucksterism is a very important part of uh, modern spirituality. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you got a huge part. Got to have a good act. You got to have a good <laughs> act, man. You got to be fancy. You have to have some special <laughs> fucking angle. It's hilarious. Well, yeah. you are. You know, you are ta- You are somehow. You know, facilitating the shredding of uh, of uh, fragile egos. Yeah, and then you must be able to implement yourself as their their channel, their portal uh, into some larger understanding, which may or may not be true. Oh, right. But the but the point of the matter is, is anybody you talk to has been involved with those type of things. They're like, yeah, I was in that for about eight years until I realized, like, you know, I just, you know, I, I just needed a job. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's, you know, that's what I love about Ram Dass is because he addresses that stuff in such an articulate, brilliant way. And what he says is these things, these different things that we get pulled into, Buddhism, Christianity, whatever it is, existentialism, becoming like a hardcore activist, skeptic, yeah. whatever the thing is, 
uh, they're self-destructing traps. The best ones are self-destructing traps, and it's designed to get you in there and not keep you forever. It's designed to get you in there until you, like, wake up or just get what you need to get out of it. Right. You know, and not stay in it for your entire life. It's not a tra- It shouldn't be a trap. Right. It's like when you drive to the beach, you don't then just sit in your car. You go hang out on the beach. Right. If most people thought about that, and I think that's probably the, the recidivism rate. Is that what it's called for, for those kind of situations? It's probably fairly large. I mean, imagine a lot of people split. You yes. know, if the, if the leader doesn't crack up entirely. Yeah. But, but the people that stay are usually the people that, you know, do the office work. Right. You need somebody to run the business, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, it's a really, it's a, I think that it's, that's what's so funny about, uh, deciding to like meditate or get into this stuff and go in, into whichever way that you want to go into it is that it just, it's not, it's not about becoming something else. And it's not about deciding that this person or that person is the conduit for all truth in the universe. That's yeah. a ridiculous thing. It's that, and that's a weak thing, you yeah. know, I think. And the, the, it's really fucked up how people will allow themselves to seem like that thing. Like they'll pretend that they're that's the water. Racket. It's a racket. Yeah, but I, you know, I also think the, the under, the unspoken part of it is more so than not, is that, you know, if somebody's lost and they're, they're in a tremendous amount of fear, they, they need something to, to grasp onto. But I, I think a lot of people, and I talk about this, this idea a lot here is that, you know, people need to feel part of something. And, and, and a lot of people can't, don't have the fortitude to necessarily get to where you are, which is, to to you know forego the middleman after a lot of research and just realize that you're part of something at all times anyways and everything is in flux and that's it. Yeah. Some people need like a little more definition than that. Yeah. All right. So you're the guy that knows the thing. Okay. Uh, I'll be here with you for a while with these other people. What do you got? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And and it seems like the best uh, the best teachers are the ones who don't allow that to happen you right, know you have right. to you really would have to you would wouldn't want that to happen i i don't think you would want that to happen you would want ideally i would think people to just recognize that you're just as much a part of the thing as they are i mean you're all part of the right but unfortunately you know uh, you know business is business for most of these people right well yeah i mean that is yes i think so i think some people are definitely they've just made that weird decision that i'm gonna fucking juice people and let them think i'm god yeah can you imagine it's a lot of responsibility oh you have to love people That's... you also have to have no fucking conscience whatsoever on some level i mean you can love people but to to to, to, to the, the what it takes the sort of blindside and gift that it takes to to actually whether you believe it or not to remain in that position, to know that people are following you. Yeah. Either you've got to really believe it for yourself, or you know somewhere in your heart that I'm taking these fucking people for a ride. Yeah, yeah. So sure. sadly, if you are a person that believes that you are that person, that God, that entity, yeah. then you got problems. Yeah. But if you're a person that's just taking people for a ride, it's a different set of problems. Yeah. And something, you know, a little more uh, dubious, but at least understandable. Yeah. Because then you're not necessarily a psychopath, you're just a fucking con man. But if you really believe it, then you got bigger problems. Here's the biggest fucking problem is that in the midst of all these monstrous charlatans, there are people who really wake up. There are people who wake up. They serve their purpose. It's yeah. like the shitty teachers at high school. You never know. They get through sometimes. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, there are real... I, I do believe they're gurus. I do believe that there's teachers and people who've just done... Whether by like mutating their brain or maybe it's like a terrible accident or who knows, but they've somehow figured out a way to just become love or just generate yeah. love for, for people around them. Yeah. 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 And I think that's possible and it does happen rarely, but I think it does happen. So, so, okay. So, w- well, two questions. Where do you fall on the it's wired into us versus there's some sort of external, uh, continuity? Okay, I, well, I, you know, have you ever read the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali? No. It's fucking amazing, man. You should check it out. It sounds so, it sounds esoteric and hard to read, but it's really badass to read about, uh, the, uh, psychology. Like, the, the, he has this whole system of psychology in there, which is this idea that, so you, you sort of, you have the external world, right? And yeah. the external world, is reflected inside of your mind. Yeah. And that's definitely true. Like sure. you can't argue with the fact that photons go into your uh that's optic our, nerve. our perception of the external world is limited to our perception. Yeah, well our perception of the external world is a reflect a neurological biochemical sure. reflection okay. of the external okay. world. Okay. So um so the idea is that you know 
you have a person in your mind, someone you don't like, I don't know. Yeah. And, and so that happens a lot when when someone's done done you wrong or yeah. you you have you're holding a grudge, right. you'll think about this person and then you'll feel pissed off, you know, you'll right. get angry, right? right? So the name that, that for that aspect of your brain is show that, business is that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Show business is in your brain, man. But that that's called a vritti, which means kind of like a cyclone or tornado. So like f- spinning in your mind are all these little cyclones and tornadoes, which represent people that you like or people you don't like. Uh-huh. And they're all replicas yeah. of the thing that you encountered in the external world. But right. it creates the illusion that... The, the, the person that you're somehow connected to the person, you right, know, when right. you're mad at someone, you're connected to them, but you're really not. You're just experiencing this little, tiny little part of your brain that is a, a, a biochemical reflection of that person. Right. So when people, and I, I do wonder, like, is it outside of us or inside of us? And then I just start thinking, well, I don't think it matters because we're outside. We are outside. Like you're part of the universe. Like you're as much a part of the I'm a, fabric. I'm a very large part. A wonderful part. Oh, thank too. you very much. Yeah, <laughs> but you're but but you're as much a part of the universe as a rock or a mountain sure. or the sky. So when people are like, is it outside of us? It's like, well, it's you're it. All one. What's outside of you anyway? Right. You know, all one exactly. Right. So, all right, so getting back to your first experience, you brought up the ego and the idea of moving the ego aside or or at least breaking it down. You're talking about Ram Dass, that the, his guru was able to, to free him from the ego long enough for him to have some sort of enlightenment or to find yeah. some sense of, of universal love or that type of possibility or continuity. I mean, when did you know that that was uh, on, on the menu? I mean, was it from that that first book? I mean, when you say... Uh, he is going to sleep. He is driving a car. Yeah. He, that is an exercise to to what? To distance yourself from the vessel. But I mean, ultimately, what is the? What, to explain to me the idea of of ego eradication. Well, that's see, it's not eradication. Okay. It's, and that that can create a lot of problems for people because they start thinking like, okay, here we go. I'm going to get spiritual. So let me just destroy myself because it's just so awful. I'm going to have to get rid of it. That's trouble. That's fucking trouble, because now it's like, now you're at war with yourself. And like, also, it, me- it leaves you vulnerable to being a fucking, uh, you know, uh, psychic dumpster. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, man. And it, cre- <laughs> it creates all this guilt. It creates all this guilt, and it's like, you know, most of us from, you know, when we were kids, the thing we always experienced was this, our parents putting pressure on us in some way or another to be something different than the way we are. So... That's been the status quo for most people for for their whole lives. Is after the parents, the school, yeah, will tell them to be someone else, and then after that, you know, the job maybe will like they're always under pressure to not be who they are. So it's not ego eradication; it's more of a surrender that to to just accepting like the way you are right now, this way that you are right now. Yeah. This is perfect. This is perfect. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't. That means you can just keep eating Doritos or don't exercise or. No, it just means that, like, if you if you don't accept it, the possibility of you uh, not only being miserable but continuing to do what's negative is high. Yeah, man. Exactly. That's exactly it. And and, and the one thing most people have not tried is the practice of loving themselves. Most people have, they think that that's selfish or indulgent, or when they hear it, they're like, what are you, how? Well, yeah, well, I, I think what it is, is it's sort of daunting. Because I think that what the West does is is really keep us in a state of unmeetable desire it, it, that, you know, capitalism in and of itself exploits desires. It requires you don't feel comfortable in order to persist. If you don't need things, then the whole system falls right so you, you know you got to be in a state of perpetual need and you got to feel like you're not quite whole unless you have that thing i need that thing yes and how much does that thing cost well there's a cheaper version of it I, that's a pretty good thing maybe i can afford <laughs> yes. the, the, the expensive thing but any of that you know if if what you're saying is you know uh you know full self-consciousness and and the ability to self-love is a threat to the order of things uh, on, on a on a larger level but on an individual level I think, unfortunately, we're wired to believe that that success, ambition, and uh, and and hard work, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, that you, we're really wired to believe that we're never enough. You know, even, whether it's by yeah. your parents or culturally, that uh, you know, like I'm not quite there yet, or you know, it's never enough. You know, it's it's not the process; it's the result. 
very result driven, career driven. Yeah. So loving yourself. I mean, the big question is like, why? Why would I do that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, how will I be able to survive? Yeah, I mean, I got things to do. <laughs> this is hell. Yeah. How am I going to suffer in hell if I love myself? You're going to ruin hell for me. And also, surrender is difficult because it does require that. And you brought that up. It does require that. You know, allowing yourself to to um, to accept love. You know, that's tricky for me. Oh God, have and you I, figured it out? I. It's so hard. It just makes you cry. You know, the the, the weird thing. <laughs> It's just like so I don't. True. I don't know why it's so uncomfortable. I can't quite figure it out. You haven't tracked it in yourself. Why? Because you know, a lot of people are just like I think about entertainers. I was talking about this to another guy the other day. Is that like so many entertainers? 